Constitution and laws. Are we able to the Constitution and laws? Of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And the bylaws of the town of Reading. And the bylaws of the town of Reading. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Your credit card too, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, good evening. Tonight is uh, April 14th, uh, our Tuesday night Board of Selectmen meeting. Our agenda will begin as it generally does with uh, our liaison comments. I'd like to open up tonight, first of all, and again, uh, congratulate Mr. Berman for a well-run election. Great turnout. Um, yeah, that's a, a great turnout for our candidate. <laughs> yes. Uh, it, it, to echo Dan's point, it was a little surprising to see something sub 2,000 plus or minus uh, hmm. voters turn out, but um, we live in the greatest country in the world, and one of our rights as citizens is the right to vote for our elected leaders and provide for the relatively painless transition of authority and uh, um, in other countries they take arms and um, a great personal cost to the citizenry and uh, it's uh, kind of a normal natural thing every two years or four years or six years depending on your office so again congratulations to Barry and uh, to all the candidates who ran this year and won. Uh, we'll open up with select and liaisons reports. We'll open up the floor for public comment, if any. We'll hear from our town manager on uh, his weekly report. We have a couple of proclamations this evening. And then uh, we'll do, as the board does every year, we'll go through a formal reorganization, which is the process by which the board elects its own next chair, vice chair, and secretary um, in its own little reorganization. Uh, and then I'll, I'll let the, uh, we'll go through a series of other discussion items. <coughs> Um, an hours of operation discussion uh, for Dunkin' Donuts and Walker's Brook Drive. Hearing about driveway variants at 74 Edgemont Ave. We'll hear from the Climate Advisory Committee regards Earth Day and the Reading Garden Club and Reading Cultural Organizations um, regarding a May 16th community event. Um, we'll hear from the uh, MAPC regards a member report uh, and uh, service inventory and then entertain a bylaw discussion regards associate members. Um, we'll close with the um, approval of minutes and then we'll adjourn to executive session for a matter involving litigation. Uh, with that, I will turn to my right and uh, take any other further comments. Uh, just uh, to add, Mr. Chairman, I believe the Dr. Doherty and uh, Jean Borofsky from the school committee will be here as part of our service inventory discussion as it touches upon some budgetary issues as well. Good. Doing liaison reports as well? Or? Please. Okay. <coughs> so do my pile of stuff. Okay, uh, attended the uh, March 25th uh, FinCom meeting. Uh, uh, most interesting report is a uh, field trip I took uh, on March 31st. That was a Tuesday to uh, The Edge, which is an indoor recreation facility in Bedford. It has two acres of, uh, it's a bubble over three uh, artificial fields, which mm -hmm. is r raised for four months during the winter and then taken down. Here it is in behind. Yep, we have some pictures of it here. Uh, <coughs> this is j just an exploratory uh, visit in case uh, the opportunity presents itself in the future for the town to get some idea of the costs. Uh, single biggest takeaway was it, it rents out for about 600 an hour and that's also the daily cost of maintenance. So you potentially can make eight times the hourly rate if you rate, rent the thing out, uh, eight times the cost of daily operation. It's about a million dollar capital investment foundation and uh, bubble, plus some uh, expenses to take it down, put it up every year. And is that uh, a regulation soccer field, you say? This is uh, 400 by 
400 wow. feet by 200, so it's almost two full acres. And, and there's room for spectators, although not mm -hmm. a huge amount along one of the sides. And I assume they, a larger or smaller bubble can be accommodated if sure. circumstance. And they can separate this out as they frequently do. They can have three events at once with netting. Right. Wow. Uh, also on uh, April 1st, I attended the MAPC Economic Development uh, Forum. A <coughs> number of you also did at the Pleasant Street uh, Center. A uh, number of interesting concepts were presented there for different parts of the town, some of which looked just grand, some of which left me scratching my head. So <laughs> I think uh, we'll look forward to their follow-up report in June. Uh, also last night, I attended the uh, CPDC Public Forum on Zoning. Uh, which dealt with uh, commercial tower bylaw changes, uh, changes to the preamble, and changes to the aquifer protection district. And again, there'll be much more of a public process coming in the future as we uh, get ready to gear up for a fall town meeting and, and some additional changes to the bylaw. Thank you, Dan. John? Uh, yeah, I attended the, um, as I do every month, the ARCASA meeting. Um, my liaison responsibilities extend to becoming a board member there. And there was a very interesting exercise that was arranged by um, Erica McNamara, which I thought was very productive. Uh, I know Mark was there as well. And yeah. so um, what she did was um, divided all, the entire board of directors of ARCASA by discipline and then um, intermixed those so that we could understand where we all had various centers of influence. The object of the exercise was to try to create more awareness for what our CASA really is. I mean, it's doing wonderful work. Um, the work that they've done in, in grant writing to you know, forward the cause uh, against substance abuse has just been unbelievable. Um, I mean, what they've been able to accomplish there which is helping us both from a public safety standpoint and also from an educational standpoint has been great. You know, I think that all of us feel like it would be really important for us to together as a board interact with each other's centers of influence and do our best to make, you know, the public, you know, in Reading and surrounding areas um, more aware of all of the resources that are available through our CASA, and there are many. Um, it you know, it's interesting that ARCASA you know is a you know is an acronym that says it's against um, substance abuse and clearly it is, um, but what it's for is much more important than what it's against. What it's for is you know mental health, um, well-being at every level, at, at the level of our youngest children and our most senior citizens, and. The resources that our CASA has actually extend that entire broad breadth, and and I think that it's an organization that is exemplifying the thing that we've all been working on most recently over the last year or so, and that is partnerships between committees, boards, uh, commissions, uh, the private sector, um, and to that end, uh, at that our CASA meeting, there was a. Um, there was an announcement that many of the youth sports organizations um, had put together in concert with the Recreation Department um, an evening with a gentleman by the name of Chris Heron, which may be familiar to a lot of the people in the room. Uh, Chris was probably one of the you know most outstanding and, and notable uh, high school basketball players when he was in high school. Um, went on to a Boston College scholarship, um, went on to make us some serious mistakes in judgment regarding the use of substance. And in a very pointed and straightforward way, um, he talks about those mistakes, about, you know, blowing a opportunity for an education at Boston College, um, finding his way to another school uh, out west, finding his way to the NBA, um, and yet you know, all of that was not enough um, to help him with his struggles against substance. U ultimately, he found help, you know, in some of the resources that um, an organization like ARCASA presents. So um, that, that event was hosted uh, about a week or so ago at the high school. 
and I think it, it's notable that um, although that was not necessarily something that was sponsored by the schools, it was done in the schools and it was sponsored by local nonprofit organizations in concert with the Recreation Committee. When all was said and done, there were nearly 400 people there. Um, and I would say that there was probably half of those people or more, probably two-thirds, were children. You know, children from probably the ages of eight and nine right up through high school. And I can tell you unequivocally that Chris Heron um, owned the attention of those young, of everyone in the audience, but especially the young people. Um, it, he was designed for about an hour presentation. Hour and 45 minutes later, we had to rescue him. The kids would not stop <laughs> asking him questions. And I think that that's really important. I think that that created um, an enormous dialogue, um, probably with parents and children. Uh, there could have been quiet cars, there could have been noisy cars on the way home. But what it did, those children literally would not let him leave. They mobbed him for questions. They wanted to talk to him. And he talked about everything from not just substance abuse, but bullying and, you know, how do I deal with depression? He talked about mental health, which I think is really, you know, something that is really important to all of us in town and that we share that message as often as possible. And, and I think the fact that uh, uh, and our CASA stepped forward um, at the beginning to let everybody know that they were there. They had an informational booth set up. Um, and I think that was very meaningful. I had quite a number of people. I was asked to be the Master of Ceremonies, which was a real privilege and honor for me to do that. Um, I've heard from now probably a dozen people just in a random way uh, thanking um, whoever put that together. And, you know, I've responded always that it was a partnership of, of, of all of us, which is really what our cost is really about. It is a coalition. So that's a le rather lengthy report, but I think it's an important one, and I think we're taking important strides forward in the battle against substance abuse. So um, I'll keep you informed. Uh, and I will be noisy about this. It's something I promised <laughs> to do at the last board meeting to, you know, to speak about this on a on a regular basis every time I have the opportunity for the public and every time we have the opportunity, you know, on, on RCTV for the public to hear it um, at home in their pajamas. Uh, so that's it. Thank what's, you, uh, John. What's so powerful about that, John, is you take a man, a young man who's gone through a difficult walk and taking the time to inform, it's almost a letter back to himself when he was younger. It's kind of paying it back, wishing someone had taken the time and had the presence of mind to speak to himself at a point in his life when he might have had a, a difference, might have had a, uh, an impact. And, and you know as well as I do, having attended some of the ARCASA events, you look at the consequence of substance, <coughs> sorry, substance abuse and prevention is always so much more effective and then is correction and if you can get these kids young enough and get them to pay attention and that's the advantage an athlete has or somebody who's got notoriety who comes from an environment where these kids can recognize who the individual is and pause for a minute and listen um, that's going to have a lasting effect and it's going to have much more effect than who knows how much time spent 16 or 20 years later trying to correct the problem so Thank you, John. Kevin? Um, I don't have any liaison reports per se, but I did want to bring up one thing in regards to this past election. Um, I'm, I'm sure most people in the room probably realize we had a little bit of a snafu during Election Day where two of our um, counters went down, and at the end of the night... By that, you mean machines, not people. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, I should say. I should say. I should clarify right the, follow. the counters might have gone the, the couple of counters were close <laughs> to probably going down. Yeah, I think uh, so. two, of the two of the machines that count the ballots went down in, in precincts two and eight, uh, which meant at the end of the night when voting was over that they had to be counted by hand. Um, so I, I went down there just because I said, this is an opportunity you probably don't see too often, and hopefully we won't see too often in the future. Um, but I did want to... Um, to publicly let it be known 
how the um, law in, in the clerk's office handled uh, the situation down there, you would have thought she had done this 20 or 30 times. Um, she had everything, there was no doubt at, at, at the close who was going to give direction as to how the procedure was going to be, and exactly the procedure itself um, was, was spelled out for the volunteers that, that were there helping. It was actually pretty impressive to see, um, even though it took a long time, act, the speed that they set up with and um, how well they not only the clerk's office handled it, but also the volunteers who had been there already for um, since 7 a.m. For, for some of those folks. Um, so I did want to just mention that and have that on the record. It was, it was nice to see that, you know, um, preparation does pay off in, in these instances and, and it turned out where it took a little bit longer but, but every vote was counted that night I'm told <laughs> so I just wanted to congratulate um, all the all the volunteers from that day especially volunteer the, uh, the clerk's office as well for really really pulling out uh, what, what was a, uh, a tough scenario thank you Kevin Barry it's been a whole week you must have a Selectman's liaison. <laughs> uh, the whole ten minutes. I, I, spent, I spent the whole week trying to collect signs. So. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody has one, please drop it off. I'll, I'll tell you, it takes about three months before they all show up. <laughs> <laughs> Any comments? Uh, no, just um, excited to be here and good. Ready to do it again. Good. Thank you. Um, before I open the floor for public comment, uh, there was an event, a need for. Uh, Reading Police uh, on Francis Drive tonight, where I live, and I oh. did want to thank Officers Droshke, Levita, and Stanaski for tremendously professional performance and support during a, a difficult time. I, um, I seldom have a need for Reading's uh, public services or public safety, and uh, when the need occurred, they came, and it was just fantastic to see these gentlemen kind of execute themselves in a difficult circumstance. So. Uh, just a public thank you to all of them. Um, with that, I'll open the floor for any public comment. Mr. Brown. Uh, Bill Brown, uh, representing the uh, trustees of the library. Uh, excuse me, cemetery tonight. <laughs> Probably will go before a building committee, uh, hopefully, mm -hmm. if, if the Attorney General sees fit to. Um, however, we <coughs> would like to see your endorsement for the article this year, uh, considering that it won't be uh, fiscally till 17, I believe, in the budget. That would give the uh, building committee a year to look at it, and we feel that we would go along with if they said. It should be combined with DPW, much to my regret, uh, or it should be a separate building. We'd go with that, and we would hope that the board and the selectmen would do other two same. I know you didn't take a vote on the article, and in the uh, one of the comments that was in the background by the FinCom, uh, they want to sit back and look at it again. Well, I would suggest since 1985, we've looked at every piece of property on. Walker's Book Drive, the gentleman to your right knows full well because his name is in here as a member of the Industrial Development Committee. We had a DPW relocation committee. We've looked at every piece of property there is in this town, unless you guys know something that I don't. Uh, I don't see the um, you know combined building down there. Especially when Weston and Sampson uh, in the last rendition said they would not as uh, invest one cent down there because of the wetlands. And going back a little bit on that, I don't know how much Bob has gone through. You guys looked at the plans. Um, the last plan called for 52 parking spots, 14 of which depended on a uh, waiver from uh, Coscom. The 65 time employees, the 65 DPW full and part time employees. So where are you going to put the other 13? Stop. You're behind the eight ball to stop. That's my procedure. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Any other public comment this evening? Okay, thank you. Bob? Um, thanks to Kevin's remarks. I agree uh, the town clerk's office did a great job, as did uh, all the volunteers. Um, the town clerk did have some practice. There was, if you'll recall, a somewhat controversial mayoral race in Lawrence not too long ago. <laughs> Yes. She was asked to help with the hand count up there. Oh. There was a lot more people dressed like this fellow <laughs> <laughs> than we needed uh, in Reading, fortunately. 
and you know if there's ever a time for there's eight precincts there's nine machines there's one spare three broke if there's ever a time for that to happen it's not during a presidential primary <laughs> so in some ways the low turnout you know made the night go they might still be counting if they were presidential <laughs> Bob, could I, could I ask one job. question? Sure. I, I, a suggestion had arisen that uh, why can't one of the uh, good, you know, units be uh, zeroed out and used for not, that? Is that not, just not, not allowed by state law? It's not allowed. Okay. No, she she was in touch with the state elections uh, division all along. Mm -hmm. Did exactly what she was supposed to do in that regard. Um, and sometime in May, you will see a, a motion to get the process for the next voting machines and speed it up. Good. It's in the capital plan for July. We need them for next November's election. And Bob, they, they, I'm sorry. Go ahead, will they be the same type of machines we have now, or maybe a no. more interactive? Kind well, or? I suppose not significantly different. Uh, mo more modern technology, but not earth shaking. No. I can imagine that would have been a mess had those been machines that uh, didn't have a hard copy right. response. Yeah. Oh yeah. And and just to be clear, what they chose to do, which I, I agree with is they recounted by hand every vote counted, even though the machine had a record up until when it broke and you could sort of see. But mm -hmm. just in case the machine had, since it mal malfunctioned right, function, eventually, right. who knows what it might have done sure, along the way, the right so they way recounted way. everything, which is why it took a little extra time. Right. Um, another part of the election, which is certainly worth mentioning, is the charter. Um, Mr. Brown hasn't left. He's certainly one of the representatives of the charter committee. And uh, I'll tip my hats. I, I listed their names over the weekend for you. Um, that group did a really interesting and, and long amount of work. Um, sometimes you see uh, unanimous votes after a committee has, has done things. I can tell you through anything I've done in 20 years of town government, that was the least unanimous group I've ever worked with, partly because <laughs> Bill, Bill was there. Um, there was a lot of really spirited discussion that were very fundamental as to how the town should be run and how it should be set up. Um, I dare say that every single member of the Charter um, Committee did not get exactly what they wanted, but every single one of them agreed that this was a fantastic end product, and that's exactly what should happen with volunteer boards. I, I was really very proud to be a part of it. Um, as you know, the uh, local portion uh, passed overwhelmingly. It was almost 80 percent. I have an interesting story that I won't take too much time on the governor's signature. Um, <coughs> The House passed the Charter, as we requested. The Senate didn't like it. They wanted two amendments. That's the reason why at your last meeting I asked you to agree to accept these two amendments. One of them was a state law which made sense on elections. That we, it was a section of the Charter we hadn't touched. The other was a cosmetic change we thought up front. The Senate then passed uh, the Charter. The House then passed the same version as the Senate. It went to the Governor's desk for a signature one. would think that would be easy. Not so fast. <clears throat> the governor noticed that the Senate passed a version that did not include those two amendments. It was the original one that Reading had asked. And how the governor's staff can have eagle eyes like this, I don't know, but they realized this, did, this version was not the ones that the Board of Selectmen requested, so he wouldn't sign it. So the process now is the governor, because now the local election has passed, which changes some of the timing, uh, it's a little bit unusual, but the governor has the authority and will make uh, four amendments. Uh, the governor will send that back to the Senate and the House. Um, they will both pass it, then the governor will sign it. So Reading actually doesn't have to do anything. I was on the phone for most of yesterday, driving through a few states talking to town council, but I, I talked to them a little while ago, and they've come up with a version where Reading does nothing, so that's always a good solution, we figured. <laughs> so they'll work it all out, and, and it's retroactive to uh, I think yesterday the town clerk certified the election. So okay. whenever the governor does ultimately sign it, it is as effective as of yesterday. So no, no worries there. So all is well, it ends well. But um, as you can probably imagine, town council in working with the charter committee thought he had covered every path and every possibility mm -hmm. because of the timing of all this. But here's one thing he, none of us really foresaw. But it would work out fine. Could you mention the implication on the uh, board of assessors and the individual who was written in? Yeah, um, we'll t is Steve in the room? He's still here. He's still oh, yeah, there he is. I'll have to talk to you. Uh, my understanding is in the charter that an elected official cannot serve, other than town meeting, cannot serve in another appointed role. So um, I'll talk to town council about that. He agrees with that. Mm -hmm. But as to what the best process is going forward, we'll have to talk. Uh, my guess is um, 
Mr. Crook should probably resign from the bylaw committee, um, be sworn in as board of assessor. Um, if he so chooses to then resign, we'll post a vacancy and go through that process. Um, I'm guessing with the timing of all this that you probably will not be reappointed for the town meeting, though. Okay. So someone else will have to give the bylaw committee report at town meeting. So I think that's my understanding of the process. And then should Mr. Crook uh, choose to resign, as he's indicated, he could then come back in front of the board for a reappointment to the bylaw committee, presumably the first meeting in June. Hmm. Barry. So does that mean that we're operating under the old charter until the governor signs the new charter? Um, or do we have no charter? No. As of yesterday, we're charter. operating under the fully new charter because the election was certified. And the governor's signature, we are told, is a formality at this point. They've all accepted that. It's just a cosmetic change. So we're good to go. And just to be clear on the Board of Assessors, because this question did come up earlier today, uh, current board members, um, Mr. Crook aside, have the rest of their terms to serve. They're mm -hmm. not kicked out. Right. So they right. run right through the end of their terms, and then the replacement process begins for them. Um, that's all I have. We have a long agenda. Good. Thank you. Thank you. We have um, two proclamations, which I'll read quickly, and then we'll uh, proceed with the rest of the agenda. Um, I'll read them. Um, the first is a Proclamation of Public Safety Telecommunications Week. Whereas there are 11 public safety dispatchers working in the town of Reading, and whereas our public safety dispatchers serve the citizens of Reading with dedication, loyalty, and pride, and the citizens of Reading rely on public safety dispatchers as their vital link to our fire, police, and ambulance services. And our public safety dispatchers connect our citizens to our public safety providers who may apprehend a criminal, save their possessions from fire, or save a life or the life of a loved one. Therefore, each year, the second week in April, is dedicated to the people who serve as public safety telecommunications, telecommunicators and in 1991, the U.S. Congress proclaimed Public Safety Telecom Telecommunications Week as a nationally recognized week, and the week of April 12th through April 18th has been proclaimed as National Public Safety Telecom Telecommunications Week in recognition of the contributions of public safety dispatchers and other telecommunicators nationwide. Very good. Okay, I'll uh, make a motion to, if you'd like, Mr. Please. Chair. Move the Board of Selectmen proclaim the week of April 12th through 18th, 2015 as Public Safety Telecommunications Week in Reading. Second. Any further discussion? <coughs> All those in favor? 5-0. Our second proclamation is... John, if you don't mind, sure. if you have a few oh, words sorry. from the Chief and the Deputy Chief and the Head Dispatcher. Gentlemen? I just yes. like to say publicly thank you to, um, to Vicki Avery, our head dispatcher, and, and all the dispatchers over at, at the police station. Uh, it's a very difficult job that they have. They're the first contact for the public uh, when there's an emergency. They need to uh, identify what the appropriate response is, get that out the door, support us along the way. And as they're doing that, they also have to assist the resident and give them instructions. And then, uh, and then to support us with whatever equipment that we need. So it's not an easy job for them. Uh, today, I was, um, I, Vicky was, was working, and uh, we had three 911 calls at the same time around 4 o'clock. We had equipment on, one, on each side of the town, and, and uh, we had two dispatches on, thankfully, and, and they were supporting that operation. So it's a difficult operation. It's kind of like air traffic controlling on a local level. And um, it's really important to what we do in the service that we provide to the community. So I'd like to say thank you for that. They do a, they do a great job. It's very difficult. And the technology for them is always changing. The job's always changing. We see call volume increase. Our procedures change. And then we see technology change. So it's, it's an important position. And they do a great job. And I'd just like to say thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Their work sometimes goes unnoticed by some of us, and uh, they really do an outstanding job behind the scenes at the station. Uh, this year especially, they were down to with some unexpected openings, and uh, they really pulled food throughout the year and did a great job coming together as a good team and uh, being there for us and for the community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
town of Reading is going through a lot of changes on a regular basis within the communication center as well. And this year, I will uh, wander into a new arena where we have a larger staff. And that is a really, really great opportunity for everybody and a big deal. And it's gonna make things a lot better for the town, for all of the residents and for the personnel that we support. Thank you. For Thank, that. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I can't imagine how difficult it is to, when that phone rings, you have no idea whether it's the victim, whether it's a or loved one, whether it's a, an emergency or just a request for common information. And you've got to, within a split second, figure out which hat you're wearing and how to process the call. That's a That's right. explaining it all. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, just to you know, I really appreciate what you do, um, and you know the, the you know both of the chiefs you know did a very nice job of thanking you and and you know something you said, Mark. You know I'm a baseball guy, and baseball guys love it when the umpires are unnoticed. It makes a fabulous game, and you mentioned <laughs> you know that we don't hear much about you except. The fact that we don't hear anything is like the great news. You do such a good job mm -hmm. that it's seamless and smooth. And, you know, every time I, I, I talk to anybody who's had an emergency at their house, they can't say enough about what happens from mm -hmm. all of public safety and the, and the kind of job you do. So I want to thank you for being a great umpire and making the game go good. <laughs> Eric, and just one more thought. While they're doing all that, they're also getting residents their parking stickers so they could be <laughs> True. anywhere in the True. middle of like you know catastrophe <laughs> they're also doing that which may be something we want to look at at some point but um, thank you for doing that too so. I had the pleasure recently of uh, interviewing many dispatchers as we're, as we're hiring some <clears throat> I have to say of any job in the town um, this, this, this other than maybe our technology staff directly has changed the most over the last let's say 10 years um, this is now a highly professional, very technical field. In addition to all the things both chiefs said, um, you know, certainly the speed at which they work is, is unparalleled. But the sophistication of the equipment they use and have to use very quickly is becoming more and more difficult every day. Um, and their, their jobs are becoming much more medical than they ever were. Uh, they need to have a great deal of medical knowledge as they're you know, handling a call. It's, it's really a very special person that can do that kind of work and can come back the next day and do it again. And sleep at night. And sleep at night. Yeah. Do you sleep at night? <laughs> <laughs> so they really do a great job in running. And you know, with our geography uh, here, obviously we're a lot busier than many communities are in this field. And uh, that makes the job even, even more difficult. They do a great job. Yeah. Um, we have a second proclamation. This one is a regards Arbor Day. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you all for Thank coming. You. The proclamation will be coming your way. Yeah. We all have to sign we it. We have to sign it, so <laughs> it saves you another trip to pick it up or get it signed. Thank you. Uh, whereas in 1872, mm -hmm. J. Sterling Morton proposed to the Nebraska Board of Agriculture that a special day be set aside for the planting of trees and this holiday called Arbor Day is first observed with the planting of more than a million trees in Nebraska and Arbor Day is now observed throughout the nation and the world. And whereas trees reduce the erosion of our topsoil by wind and water, cut heating and cooling, moderate the temperature, clean the air, help produce oxygen and habitat for wildlife, provide a renewable resource for paper, wood for our homes, fuel for fires, and count countless other wood products. And whereas trees in our town increase property value, enhance economic vitality of business areas, beautify the community, and are a source of joy wherever they are planted. Uh, now we, therefore, the Board of Selectmen of the Town of Reading, do hereby proclaim April 24th, 2015 as Arbor Day in the Town of Reading and urge all citizens to celebrate Arbor Day, Arbor Day and support our efforts to protect our trees and woodlands and plant trees to gladden the heart and promote the well-being of this and future generations. Very good. Mr. Chairman, may I add uh, diminishing the uh, stock of CO2 in the atmosphere to, to that proclamation just informally. Move that the Board of Selectmen proclaim April 24th, 2015 as Arbor Day in Reading. I have a second. second. Kevin will second. Any further discussion? 
All those in favor? 5 0. Very good. We'll sign those later. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, the town will reorganize. Um, I'm going to turn the gavel over to our town manager, and uh, we'll, the town manager will help facilitate nominations for the uh, chair, vice chair, and secretary for the balance of uh, this next year. Up. <laughs> I can do whatever I want. Yes. <laughs> oh, boy. No. <laughs> well, well, well. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'd like to move to open the floor for nomination for the uh, role of Chairman of the Board of Selectmen. So if anyone wants to make any nominations, John? Uh, I'd like to nominate Dan en Ensminger into the position of Chairman of the Board of Selectmen. That's my nomination. Okay, are there any other nominations? Um, seeing none, I'll close the nominations. Uh, and uh, ask you to vote on a moved movement to close the nominations. Okay. I move to close the nominations for the chairman of the board of selectmen. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of closing? 5 0. <laughs> All those in favor of Dan Ensminger for the role of chairman of the board of selectmen? Please raise your hand. I'll abstain. Okay. <laughs> Thank zero, you. One. <laughs> Turn this back to Dan. Okay. Switch or stay? Um, might as well get, well, Which is we, easier for you? Can we we just wait for a bit. We're going to have sure. much okay. more movements here momentarily. Okay. So. Um, I mm -hmm. want to thank the board for your vote of confidence. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would not, now like to open nominations uh, for vice chairman of the board of selectmen. Yeah. Are there any nominations? I'd like to um, nominate uh, John Halsey for the role of uh, vice chairman. Selectman. Young Halsey's been nominated. Is that seconded? Second. Second. Uh, discussion? Any other nominations? Uh, if so, I will move that nominations for the vice chairman of the Board of Selectmen be closed. Is there a second to that? I'll second. All in favor of closing nominations? Actually, I'm a, I don't think yes. I can second my own motion. You shouldn't. Second. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, all in favor of closing nominations for vice chair? Uh, okay, all in favor of uh, electing John Halsey to the position of Vice Chairman of the Board of Selectmen, please raise your right hand. Opposed? Abstaining. Vote being 4-0-1. John is elected. Uh, now I'd like to open nominations for Secretary of the Board of select, uh, Selectmen. Uh, are there any nominations? I'd like to nominate Kevin Sexton to the position of Secretary. Second. Are there any further nominations? Hearing yes. I move that we close the nominations. That's second. Seconded. I'll second. Uh, all in favor of closing nominations for secretary? All in favor of uh, Kevin Sexton uh, to be elected as secretary of the Board of Selectmen, please raise your right hand. Opposed? Standing? Vote being 4 0 1. John. And John and Kevin are duly elected. Uh, Very good. That's the luck, gentlemen. gentlemen. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Short, short break. You will not see this again for other years. So. <laughs> <laughs> no point. Yeah. That'll work. Yes. yes. Get that. Get that. We'll mix them up completely. Uh, Again, Barry, welcome on board. Thank you. Miss Mister. If I might, um, I included in your packet your liaison assignments. Oh, yeah. Some of those assignments yep. tend to go with the office, such as chair. Um, that's something I would suggest the board take up in the next couple of meetings in May. Okay. okay. Can I suggest a possible system that might work? Sure. Uh, if everyone would take that list and number each item, one, two, or three, one being, I really would like to do this, three being, no way, Jose. <laughs> we, will, uh, <laughs> we will adjudicate uh, accordingly and do the necessary negotiating with the <laughs> appropriate partners to achieve a result. Good. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So should we I can send that out electronically. In yeah, that would yeah, facilitate that'd be great. it. Sure. And do we then give it back to you or? Uh, Please send it back to me and I'll call, call late it off. So. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> great. Uh, yes. When do, you, when do you hope to have the, uh, when do you expect to close the assignments, the liaison assignments? Next meeting Next is meeting? May 5th and May 19th. Yeah, probably said definitely by the 19th, but okay. preferably by the 5th. All right, good, thank okay. you. All right, very good. 
Okay, our next time of business is the uh, Dunkin' Donuts Walker's Brook Hours of Operation. Uh, the applicants here? Yeah, please. Why don't, come up Why don't you come up and introduce yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm Lipton Ken, I'm the regional manager for Dunkin' Donuts. Mm -hmm. This is Alex Mantini, he's the district manager for Dunkin' Donuts as well. Very good. So we both manage the uh, Dunkin' Donuts 87 Walker's Brook Group. We opened back in August of 2013. It's a 24-hour operation. Uh, in the last 18, 19 months, we, we haven't been able to build the business on the overnight, and we wanted to seek permission to start closing the store at 10 p.m. and being able to reopen back at 4 a.m. Okay, and uh, okay, and uh, Bob, is there any prohibition from uh, no, yeah, one, one, one request? Mm -hmm. uh, CPDC discussed this, in, I guess, informally. The request they made is to make sure all the electronic signage was shut down at 10 o'clock to make sure no one yet. History of Reading, we think this is the first request to actually reduce the hours. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Normally, it's to extend hours. Uh, but uh, all the staff, as well as the volunteer boards, were asked, and there were no objections. Right. This is very different. So, but the, the gas station is open 24 hours? Yes, it is. It remains, and they'll stay open. They were 24 hours before we got there, and they yeah. plan on staying 24 hours. And your normal hours of opening were 4 o'clock? Uh, we just opened the business for 24 hours. hours. Oh, we're as, a, as a 24 hours, so we've always been 24 hours. Uh, we just don't have any business on the order. And after 10, there's really nothing happening. For coffee? For coffee. Hmm. Oh, oh. <laughs> it's like a meeting or two to get right. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, CPDC's initial request and the board's initial vote uh, was for gasoline and rest public restrooms to be available 24 hours and gas cans. Hey, uh, any further questions by the board? Just as a point of information, how come they have to request um, to reduce their hours because they want to open up at 4? Because the last um, vote by the selectmen was to approve a 24-hour opening. And they just simply can't shut their doors without without checking with us? Well, they're being polite. Okay. <laughs> just, just wanted to find out. I was curious. Yeah. Further questions by the board? No. Okay. Uh, there's no motion here. Do we need one? Uh, or is this just something you can do administratively, Bob? Oh, yeah. Um, move to allow the uh, reduced hours of Walker's Brook Drive. So, somebody want to adopt that motion? I will adopt that motion. And is there um, a second? I'll second. Oh, Perry's got it. Perry seconds. Uh, discussion? Further? So, all those in favor of the motion? The vote is 5 0. The motion carries. Gentlemen, you're approved. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have, uh, yes, we've got the appointed hour. Okay, we're going to put you to work. Yep, let me, let me pull page, this up. Page 8. We have a hearing on the driveway variance at uh, 74 Edgemont Avenue. This is a public hearing, and the secretary will read the notice. Um, town of Reading, to the inhabitants of the Town of Reading, please take notice that the Board of Selectmen of the Town of Reading will hold a public hearing on April 14, 2015, at 7.30 p.m. in the Selectmen's meeting room, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Massachusetts, on a driveway variance at 74 Edgemont Avenue. A copy of the proposed document regarding this topic is available in the town manager's office, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Mass., Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., Tuesday from 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m., and is attached to the hearing notice on the website at www.reddingma.gov. All interested parties are invited to attend the hearing or may submit their comments in writing or by email prior to the 6 p.m. on April 14, 2015 to the town manager at ci.reading.ma.us. Is that U.S.? Mine's a little blurred. Yeah, yeah. Do I have that right? Okay. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Uh, would the applicant like to introduce himself? Yes. Uh, I'm Ron Ranieri. I'm with 74 Edgemont Avenue with my wife, Carolyn Ranieri. Evening. And the reason we're here, obviously, is to ask for a variance for the driveway, uh, for the driveway, two driveways on the same street. And I'll if I might ask to introduce the topic, because I want to make sure the board understands. Sure. Okay. Um, as is shown in the picture, there's a U-shaped driveway in existence. Mm -hmm. uh, current Board of Selectmen policy allows that second driveway where it's shown. So the board has not seen this, but Board of Selectmen policy allows the engineers to approve that. So. What I had first thought was this was a, a request for a second driveway, but it's really not. Request that for request has already been granted by the engineers. Right. Um, what this is, is a request to uh, relax a condition of that, uh, as I'm sure the applicant will describe with the section drawn in red. So right now, 
both driveways are allowed, but one of the conditions is to remove that middle section, if you will, and now the applicant can explain. That. Okay. So when I, when I met with the um, engineering department, they reminded me of the policy of the selectmen that said that you can't have two driveways on the same street within 120 feet of each other. They have to be further apart than that. So this driveway is an existing driveway. And there was some confusion uh, earlier today um, when I was talking with Jeannie in that somebody thought that the um, existing, there's a garden here on the corner of the street, and there was a photograph that I took from, from this vantage point of the garden, and someone thought that the garden walkway was asking, that I was asking for that to be a curb cut. Oh. So that is not the case. Uh, the, the curb cut, that curb cut and that curb cut currently exist, and they've been there for 29 years since we moved into the house. We built that driveway. Uh, and now what we're doing is we've added a garage right there, which in this plan is right there, and we need a driveway to get into the garage. So the question is whether or not we can leave, uh, keep the, build this driveway, which we're going to do, and if we build this driveway, can we keep this little piece of driveway here? Uh, the issue in, for us as the occupants of the house is that Edgemont Ave is the school, Barrow School is on Edgemont Ave. And people come around Arcadia or onto Edgemont at a fairly good clip sometimes, and the street is totally full. Uh, I, I submitted into your packet uh, multiple photographs of the condition happening. And on the same day, I took a picture at the same time. I was standing right here, and I took a picture looking up Edgemont Ave with all the cars going up and the children and parents walking by my driveway. And I also took, just turned and took the same picture of Arcadia Ave and there was no cars at all on Arcadia Ave. And so what happens then, if we close this driveway, then the only entrance and exit to this driveway, which we use all the time, will be from Edgemont Ave. And that means we'll have to back out onto Edgemont Ave in the morning on the way to work, which presents a dangerous condition. Um, so we're trying to avoid that by leaving this curb cut here while we build this curb cut. So the request that I have is that you allow us to leave that piece of sidewalk right there, which on this engineering drawing says to be removed. Okay. Questions uh, from the board? Question. Yeah. Um, I made sure to re-ask the question of public safety just to make sure they were answering the right mm -hmm. question. And, and they agree with everything the applicant just said. Um, the more traffic that can be kept off of Edgemont, the better. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I've probably parked in your driveway several times. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Mr. Arena. Um, pursuant to your comments of uh, the safety issue in Edgemont, would you entertain um, closing the Edgemont entrance and preserving the two entrances on Arcadia? That would address your interest in public safety and uh, low degrees of traffic and still preserve uh, 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 the, the two entrances you seek. I prefer not because the, the Edgemont Ave, I mean, we come from, we always come drive down this way and come into Edgemont. So I prefer not to close the Edgemont Ave. Correct, but if I understood your prior comments, you were actually objecting to that because of the traffic. Would you, right? Your comments were that, that, that the Arcadia was preferable because Edgemont was so. Crowded. During the morning when we back up, okay. but in the afternoon, there's no traffic on okay. Edgemont. It's just in the morning. Okay. And again, I guess it happens at 2 o'clock, but we're not coming into one other question. Yes. No, Mr. Chairman. No, you want to? Go ahead. I mean, as a as a former Barrows parent, I can attest to the to the craziness of Edgemont yep. um, for that 15, 20 minutes in the morning. So, um, not backing up onto Edgemont Ave to get out of your driveway is actually appreciate safety on your part for you and and for the people driving, especially in bad weather right. when, when most people tend to drive and, and otherwise it's not as busy. So most parents, other parents will walk. Uh, but is it my understanding that once the garage is um, operational that you would close the driveway? No, or no. The only reason we'll need the driveway at the garage is to come in and out. We don't plan to park at the garage. We plan to still keep parking up here. And we just need to get into the garage in inclement weather, so we need a curb cut. So, uh, so basically to keep the three? Keep the three curb cuts. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, Bob, this has been vetted by um, Public Works and the Chief and everybody's copacetic. Yep. Okay. Yes. 
Um, Bob, did I understand you to say that the, uh, the U-shaped driveway that pre-exists, that's, that's already within Selectman's policy? Or was that a variance well, in, in and of it? The U-shaped driveway was the original driveway. But was it? A, go ahead. Yes. Well, that's actually a good question. Was that achieved through itself a variance? Be based on because it's less than 125 I don't feet. Think so. I don't think it required a variance. Might have been grandfathered. Because of two different streets. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there was no. There, yeah, I, I built the driveway. I had it built, but there was no variance required. We just went Seems to like the, the two different street thing is. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Different street. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just for information, so it's 125 feet is what typically, if that driveway was 125 feet, he wouldn't he wouldn't right. need a variance at all. Right. What, what is the the footage of this right now? Well, if you leave that two? section uh, open that he's requesting to stay open, clearly it's not 100. It's about 30 feet. Anymore. About 30 feet, okay. But if you close it, then that does meet the 125. Right, feet. right. He's quite easily. I, I, I think that uh, one argument we frequently make and one thing we uh, take, take measure of is, uh, is there a compelling public safety interest in kind of breaking the rules? I think there is in this case, and I, I certainly plan to to approve this. Yes. My only concern, Dan, would be the precedential value. I get your point about this yeah. circumstance, but in, in reflecting this forward, um, we've wrestled with 120 feet, 125 feet, 120 feet, 85 feet, um, and I just, the public safety issue could be addressed with closing the Edgemont Ave and preserving the other two. Okay, I mean, it's just a precedential thought. I don't, don't disagree with your comments about public safety. I mean, I, I walk by there many times. Actually, I went to look at it on Sunday. It is a unique yeah. property that, um, in the sense of where the house is situated relative to being really, it, it, it's not even a corner, it's more like a, a curve. So, yes. I mean, I, I'm, in, I'm inclined to support the, uh, the, the proposal um, only because I know how dangerous that situation is. And I don't think it would necessarily really be a pre precedent. I don't, I'm not sure how many houses um, are situated on that kind of uh, lot arrangement in town. And, and the confusion <coughs> that came earlier today was this walkway right here. That's yep. actually just a walkway. We believe there's a driveway there and a driveway there. Mm -hmm. That's good. So wouldn't we still be setting the precedents, however, if we, even if we closed? Uh, asked them to close the edge mod. I mean, we're still setting yeah. the precedence on the distance part. So, so. the issue is now, now you have somebody else who wants three entrances. Well, that's that's my point. Where the, even if you close that off, you still are setting precedence. Well, one thing you could do is to put some words in motion that, in view of the uh, uniqueness of the lot configuration and the uh, compelling public safety issues, which might set this apart from uh, other decisions we'd have to make. If that would comfort the uh, concerns of my comrades. Yes. So um, I guess the first question is, this is a public hearing, so I'm assuming that all the abutters have been noticed. They, they've yeah. been given notice. Yeah. Um, I've actually talked to many of them, too. They all, because they all, the garage is under construction, so we yeah. talked a lot about the garage. What's yeah. Happening? Well, the reason I, there's a reason why I'm asking that. First we'll of all, yep. you know, all the abutters have been advised. Yeah. Do we have abutters in the room who want to speak about this? Any? That have any issues with this or either for or against I mean it's just important in a public hearing to be sure that since they're all you know apprised of the hearing sure. usually if somebody's got a problem with it sure. this would be well, the time this that would they be would be the time why don't we open this up uh, the board was kind of and I didn't mean to yeah. usurp you know, his presentation but I'm well, you I know, know I think you're yeah I, I'm just kind of interested in whether or not anybody else has anything to say about this if anybody else came forward from the neighborhood no other written correspondence? No, I just have received no comments, okay. and it's very typical I do receive comments, if there are any. Well, we have recently, in, in a, not in that. Yeah. Not this case. Not in this case, but, you know, in, in the discussion around two driveways. Um, so it's, I just want to be sure that everybody's been heard and that uh, everybody's had their proper opportunity to come forward. In accordance with your concerns, are there any members of the public who would like to weigh in on this issue tonight who are present? Okay, I don't hear any public comment. I'm just inclined to say that, you know, I, I understand where John's coming from on the setting of precedent, but I do think that's pretty, I, I drove by there myself, it's pretty unusual setting 
not nice, I mean, you know, unusual though, you know, and I, I get where you've got that issue. Um, and it seems like we've already, we're way past the, the two, you know, um, and those two are actually probably closer than, I know they're closer than 125 feet. Uh, actually, they're not. The, the engineer really? did a little, he's got one of those little planimeter. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he did the radius yeah. in there. I did it by eye, and I'm probably not that good at that. Uh, but it just strikes me that that's already there. Um, and now a new garage is going in. It's logical that you would be able to drive your vehicle in, you know, in there. And I think given the, I, I think that there is enough extenuating circumstances given the school and the traffic and the, you know, previous arrangement and, you know, the, for me to be, in, be able to support this. Any further comments from the board? Um, yeah, yeah just, just real quick. I, I would, um, I'm actually in support of this as well, too. I, I, I definitely hear your concerns, John, from a precedent standpoint. I, I think, you know, we can certainly put it into record as to why we wanted to establish it in, in this instance where we have five elementary schools and we're, our precedent wouldn't be town-wide, but really would be something that's set up more to uh, a smaller locations as a result, and not to every property in those yep. locations as well. That's the thought. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I mean, the photograph that's in, that came to us of all the cars going down the street and the kids actually walking across your driveway uh, where you would be, I guess, backing out right. of in right. the morning. Um, Great and the amount of cars on, that was a nice day, on yeah. a rainy day or a snowy day, it's, it's backed up all the way to us. I can only imagine uh, when the snow, pile, when snow was yeah. piled there in a few weeks ago with that. Yeah. Was <clears throat> All right. Uh, any further comments by the board? We have two courses available to continue the hearing if you don't feel you have sufficient information to make a decision or to close the hearing and vote. Uh, what's the pleasure of the board? I'd be intended to vote today. So is there a motion to close the hearing? Uh, move to close the hearing on the driveway variance at 74 Edgemont Ave. Is that seconded? I'll second. Okay. Uh, any discussion? All in favor of closing the hearing? Motion. Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, you may want to add additional words, but I think just to make this clear, after the word curb cut, you should say removal. Okay. Uh, move for approval. Second curb cut removal. Oh yeah. Okay. At 74 Edgemont, as shown. Second okay. curb cut removal. Mm -hmm. Double negative going on here. <laughs> You're doing that in order to not take the curb cut away. Don't use no double negatives. <laughs> <laughs> Don't use any. I have a hard time keeping up. Our, our, uh, move to approve the second curb cut removal. It was originally set up to be removed. We're taking that. Yeah, you want to. We're taking the removal the, away. Oh, oh, yes. Okay. Is what we're doing. Is that right? Do I understand that correctly? Yes. Removal is not a verb in this case. <laughs> motion. Is that still right? Uh, I hear what Barry's saying here. We're, t we're, we're um, taking away a removal, correct? That's correct. Mr. Crook. Would you perhaps want to use the word delete instead of the word remove? Or could the motion say, allow the applicant to keep the second driveway on a rail? Now you're using common sense. <laughs> <laughs> Very careful about that in here. Uh, so you're moving the motion, you want to accept that language? I uh, will accept that language. You would move it. Want to read that, read that back, Mr. Secretary? Would you uh, give me that one more time? Sure. Allow, allow the applicant to keep the second curb cut on our KD Rail. Okay. All right. Is the seconder accept that change in yes. language? Yes. Okay. Is there that further discussion sense. on the motion? Hearing none. Now, all in favor of the motion? Raise your right hand. Opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. Have a good Thank evening. Yep. Nice artwork. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Great preparation. Uh, next, I am pleased to uh, welcome members, uh, member or members of the Climate Advisory Committee who will uh, fill us in on some of the happenings on Earth Day. Uh, please come forward and introduce yourselves. That's a little better than that. I'm David Williams, the present chair of the committee. And, uh, if we could have a slide on the solar array. Back here. Yep. There it is. There 
Oh, if that's we could only turn yeah. that sideways. You could take your, two, uh, take your two fingers and do this. Well, button. if you're an Internet Explorer, I can tell you how to do it. Uh, <laughs> on the trackpad, just take your two fingers. There you go. Whoops. <laughs> no, I didn't like that. Oh, that just reloads the page. Just take your two fingers and twist. Oh, is that easy? Right. I don't think it is. On the uh, touchpad? Yes, like this. UK, I can talk. Many of you have probably seen the press release yep. concerning the uh, light department exploring the community shared. That's it. That's us right here. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. This is a piece so of control R. Our committee is uh, has some members on that joint committee, as well as the town planner is on that committee. So we're looking into the possibility of having a solar panel. A uh, fairly small electrical system on the town property as a demonstration of what could be done on other RMLD properties in other communities. So, you guys, the best thing you can do is just don't do it. Don't do it because it's coming. It's David, David, unless you can do it because it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard. It, it might be better for David just to speak. He's as good as I am. Huh? So we're not in a rush. We can, if we see if we can get him to support him with this thing. If not, then he yeah. can just roll. I think we got it. Yeah. Uh, the others are okay. back. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else is upside down. No, that's all right. Oh, yeah. It might be upside down, but there we go. There we go. All right. All right. There we go. No, one more. You, you, you good? Anyway, that's no. perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Down on me. So the uh, Department of... Uh, Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources has guidelines for this type of thing and we're following those guidelines and it's really now a working project. They're looking into how much it would cost, how who would do it, as well as where it would be placed. Mm -hmm. So it's very much in the early planning stages. But we did want to let you know that it uh, is look we have been looking at it and the town planner is involved. So we'd be glad to answer some questions. Do you prefer questions now or? Not, not yes. Enough. I think they're going to go on to another topic. So, oh, okay. Feel um, free. Yeah. Do you have an, a view as to how large uh, an array this is likely to be? I've heard f 5 to 50 kilowatt. Yeah. I mean, basically, <coughs> John, it's still like in the planning stage. And uh, between RMLD really wants to do this solar array. Yeah. And which is a great thing, and uh, three of our climate committee members are on the committee, along with the town planner. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're looking for a municipal building or space or someplace to locate it. And a lot of that work is like how much, how much of an array could you purchase, mm -hmm. what would the return be, all of that is still coming that we, we still don't have hard answers for that. Thank you. And it would be a specific item and it would replace the uh, green choice situation, yep. which has been something which has not been very successful right. because nobody has known what they're buying. Uh, this, you'd be able to buy a part of the array. I, I think this is a very good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great public-private partnership. Uh, those of us who are free market guys love it because you're gonna offer shares for sale. Uh, I like it a lot, I, I hope it's successful. Well, there are, there are many homes like my own where I, I asked for uh, the possibility of putting a solar panel up. And they, they can tell right by a computer, Google, etc., yeah. that, uh, you know, if you don't have a south-facing roof, uh, if you have trees, all of these things kind of prohibit putting solar panels up. And then the other thing, of course, would be financial. You might not be able to afford a full array, but you might be able to buy a piece of it right. and, and uh, support solar. And it would be probably the first time in a long time that RMLD would actually produce its own energy, at least the beginning. Yeah. So uh, we're, we're excited and we're really happy that RMLD is strongly behind it. And with them strongly behind it, there, there's no reason why, you know, in, in some time we shouldn't have it. I think it's an awesome idea. I mean, anytime that we can take a step away from, you know, producing electricity from fossil fuels, it, it, you know, we should we should do that. Um, assuming you're looking for a public building, my guess is probably one of the school roofs uh, 
make the best sense. And I don't know, have, has anyone talked to the school department, department about that? Or it's a long story. Oh, yeah. Gina's here, <laughs> Jesse. Um, well, that's one question. And then just, you know, it, and I'm sure a lot of these things can get worked out as we go forward, but I just want to sort of conceptually understand it. So would RMLD be responsible for financing it? And part of that financing it would be for us to buy shares like we would fund an IPO of a company and therefore we own a piece of that. And for those folks who don't do it, does that mean they don't get electricity from that piece? Or no. That, 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 I mean, are we buying? I think I might be able to answer the yes. question. Yes. I'm Jesse Wilson, the community development director here in town. And this project, not specifically shared solar, but the idea of municipal solar does go back a little ways. We work with the Metropolitan Planning um, Area Planning Council for, oh, it's going on a couple years now to get this idea off the ground. We have um, participated in a regional procurement for a solar developer. and. Now with this new idea about the community show, shared solar, we met with RMLD, uh, MAPC, and school department this week about moving forward with something like this. Um, the, the developer would own the system and they would simply be leasing space on any of our municipal buildings if, in fact, it would be feasible on those buildings. Um, we've done a preliminary analysis just from a strictly a Google Earth sort of standpoint, but the next step would be to look at those from a structural standpoint. It may be that none of those are in fact feasible. We really have to look into that. Um, we would also look at ground mounted, although we really don't have a lot of plan and reading to do that. Um, but the most viable options right now would be some of the municipal buildings, school buildings, or even the Burbank Ice Arena. Good. Sorry, can I just follow up on that? Sure. Um, as someone who's um, uh, bought a lot of new cars in my lifetime. I was always um, taught that it's better to buy your car than lease your car. And so I hearken back to what we did with um, uh, performance contracting back. Um, and would it, has anyone looked at the feasibility of us actually financing this and owning it? As a, because when we're leasing it, that means that we're paying a fee for someone else to do it. And maybe it makes sense if this is, if we can find the right space, mm -hmm. we finance it ourselves over the long term we get more electricity and spend less money than if we did it um, maybe just you know working through a developer. So I don't know, again, maybe too way ahead of where this discussion needs to be. My understanding is at the end of the term, I believe it's a 10 year term, we would have the option to purchase the system. The developer would rent, we would get a rent payment from the developer on you know, having them lease the space on our roof. They would pay for the system. So we would get a lease payment as sort of revenue from that. So the developer would be responsible for maintenance of that um, and issues with the roof. All of that could be negotiated into whatever agreement or contract we enter into. As I understand it, the person that resident that owns the cell will get a certain cents per kilowatt. Correct. Per kilowatt hour. So I, 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 I do have some um, I, a couple of questions. Um, I've had some experience with this on Boy Scout properties that are out in the middle of nowhere, which are very different from, you know, what goes on. I mean, they were land-based, you know, kind of solar panels. And so am I to understand then that the developer leases space on a municipal building of one kind or another? And the buyer of the electricity has already agreed to be RMLD. Is that correct? I believe so, yes. Okay, because that's really a key element of this, you know, because it manages the pricing. Yes. Um, so if there's not a if there's not a, a buyer out in front ready to buy that electricity and then redistribute it, um, you know, then the whole thing kind of implodes on itself. Right. So it's important for us to understand all of those incremental pieces of how that works. And I and I do have to say, I mean I don't know about everybody else, but I get about six phone calls a week, you know, you know, congratulating me on having a great house to put solar panels on. <laughs> um, and it's, it gets a little, you know, I get tired of the calls, first of all. Just I kind of don't believe anybody that calls me that way. And so lastly, if, I mean, if we had a way <coughs> so that citizens of this town could understand what was going on, where it worked, how it worked, does it then extend residentially to the right kinds of homes? 
I mean, I, I do think this is a really important step if we can do it. Um, but it's kind of important that in, in a linear way, you got to have green lights flashing all the way down the line on this thing. So it would be important for us to hear. I'm really glad you guys are bringing this to us. I think it's a great idea. It would be important to hear from RMLD about their intentions to purchase the product at the other end. And then you exactly. certainly want to look at the developer and, you know. I think that would only be true if it was a practical. Yes, uh, so they had to look into the finances yeah. um, pretty heavily. Uh, a lot of moving parts here. There was, and, and the, the state solar renewable uh, energy credit program was recently rolled out not too long ago for the second time. So a lot of what we've been doing has kind of been in a holding pattern until that was released. Now, with this type of community shared solar, it is actually more feasible under this program from a financial standpoint with RMLB to do it. So um, RMLB <coughs> sounds like it would work. Um, they have to get into the details of it. We have to first find a spot that would work, and depending on the size of the system. So the follow-up question to that is, wherever, wherever the panels are mounted, is that, is that building then become the buying beneficiary of that <coughs> power? Or does it route, you know, back through the system through our? My understanding is it goes back. It's yeah, yeah, that's it that's you know that's generally what happens. That's why I'm really interested in understanding how the pieces connect. Oh, yes. um, just to back up a little, this discussion's been going on for at least ten years, and I'll, I'll tell you right up front, the finance is a lot more complicated than the science. <coughs> um, there's federal tax credits, the state tax credits. Um, the most difficult issue historically has been the Board of Assessors and to say there's a value here that's going to be taxed. And that has killed off a lot of deals in some of our neighboring communities. So the finance here is extremely complex. Uh, make no mistake about that. So there's some unintended business consequences yeah. that go along with It'll the nonprofit. Be thoroughly hashed out yeah. though because we're in a unique situation with RMLD as opposed to most other cities and towns that have this issue. So we, we don't have some of the options that they do in terms of federal tax credit. Um, again, the finance is complex. It, it, it'll be solved. Um, first of all, this is probably the closest we'll ever come to money from the sky. Right? It is money from the sky. <laughs> and so, anytime you get that happening, take it. Um, just to amplify John's comments, there's another dimension of this that I'd urge RMLD to look at carefully. Um, at least as of recently, these are production assets, they're out in the open, so they're, one, they have a natural lifetime of between 15 and 25 years for their production capacity, just naturally, it's not wear out, but it's other factors. And two, there's a vulnerability to hail or thunderstorms that yeah. you may or may not want to take on as a product producer. You may want to lease, I understand Barry's point around the finances, but I, you may not want that risk of ownership a production asset. It's one thing if it's a telephone pole or a wire. It's another thing if it's a major source of electrical energy that everyone else has already signed with to buy and you can't sell it. So well, take a look at it carefully. One thing, John, is that we have uh, Tom Alila, who's like, uh, he's an engineer at RMLD, mm -hmm. and he's kind of the, in a sense, uh, Jesse, is he sort of the chair of the committee who's looking into this? Is I believe Tom? he's the new energy services coordinator over there. So, uh, there are some pretty bright people. Um, RMLD is, the, the, the general manager is for it. She's, when Tom came and talked to our committee, uh, he said, you know, they told them they want to get this done. So I, I think uh, the, all the people are kind of for it. Everybody wants to make it happen. It looks like, uh, as Jesse said, it looks like the state might even make it a little bit more uh, financially feasible to do it with wrecks for solar, et cetera. So, uh, you know, we don't have the answers. You're asking all the right questions, but it's still on, it's still beginning. But I will say it seems like there's a little more impetus behind this than we've seen before. And our hope is that it'll, it'll, it will come to, uh, to fruition. That's, that's the hope. A lot, of, a lot of problems, but you know, once we, we get by this, if we can solve these problems, the second time is going to be a lot easier. And there were three other towns involved with RMLD, and so it, it could be the beginning. Well, you know, it's less about the problems and more just about, you know, airing out all of the issues. Because there's a, as I said earlier, you know, there are the back end financing around these things. You know, there's 
investors are sold tax credits. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a lot of things that are going on behind the scenes. And when we deal with the municipality, we got to, you know, we got to pull the curtain down so that everybody understands exactly what's going on. And, and, and I think it's, I think it's more opportunities than problems, to be honest sure. with you. I think it's a, I think it's a great thing to bring forward. I'm not sure, I mean, is this more information for us than it is yeah. something you're asking yeah. us to do? Yes. This is just an informative. This is, yeah, this is, this is exciting. It will be a small array. <clears throat> just, do we have any examples nationwide, statewide, or otherwise that plans like this have been successfully put together and, and are making you know, breaking even and making the community solar yeah. model. Um, I think, I think there are out there. I don't, you know, I haven't done a lot of personal research on on specific examples, but um, there are uh, there are some recent projects that are moving forward, especially with the SRT two program that that I just mentioned that came out. It is making it much more financially feasible to do a project like this. Um, you know, it's just it's it's at its infancy. We just <coughs> met, you know. With with the solar developer, RMLD, and, and MAPC last week, and as Bob mentioned, the financials get pretty detailed, and all of that needs to be worked out, but, um, you know, the first, first step, at least for us, would be to find a site that's viable, because we don't even have a site that's viable. It's not really worth, you know, going through the challenges yeah. and the hoops associated with the finances. How about that land up on West Street? I'm, can they put this under power lines, or is that not feasible? They have they own land up there, I think, where the power line comes in. They'll, yeah, I mean, we'll be looking at, hmm. at sort of That's all municipal land. Um, a lot of our, our own land is under conservation restrictions, but. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would suggest looking at the Warner New Hampshire site. They have a very similar system, uh, which is owned by their electric company and bought in. Uh, so that's up and running? That's up in morning. In morning, in the morning. As you drive around 495 and now the Mass Pike, you'll see the state is using this. There's more and more solar arrays everywhere you look. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're public, private. I assume they probably are. Yeah, 93 has one as well. So There's just no. Yeah. 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 You see it a lot in rotaries, or not rotaries, uh, interchanges. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just dead land, you know, right in the middle of the figure eight. So there's, there's a lot of them going on. Um, the one thing I would want to say, just from a residential standpoint, if we can get through um, financial program, we can really make this make sense. The residential standpoint is, is the, the community would be thrilled to buy in. Um, we certainly live in a community, I think as most have pointed out tonight, where your house doesn't qualify. So you have lots of folks that want these on their house, um, and they don't qualify. You also have people that wouldn't like these on their house, but they don't want to get into the contracts where you don't have to pay for them. Um, where they're, they're, you know, the company is coming in and will service them and they're, they're going to kind of do the same thing. They, they don't like getting into those contracts in general for their home. Um, this kind of solves a lot of those issues uh, where folks, one, either can't do it or two, don't want to get into that scenario where they're the ones that are, that are leasing these out, so to speak. And they can't, you know, a lot of times they're, they're not feasible to, uh, to buy them outright and own them. This, this is a nice solution for those folks. The other point is uh, the, the government giveth tax credits and the government taketh them away. And that's that's a big importance to the homeowner. Uh, is this been vetted against the loss of tax credits? That it could still be viable if they go away? It seems to me it's less vulnerable because of the scale. But the, these are great questions, but I, I, I don't want to, I'm just wasting your time. Yeah. Again, you know what I mean? Because <laughs> it's a question you, to ask somebody. You, yeah. Just. All of that stuff has to be go. I don't mean to beg off, but I, I, I no, it's an exp exploration. Yes. You know, you've, you've opened up, a, you know, yeah, a great topic be. for discussion, and nobody expected. No, I know that. I know that. Just, but, uh, I think it's, it's just a lot of excitement we're, around it. <laughs> well, I, I, we're, we're grateful. We'll come back. Okay. You know, we'll come back. Uh, we want to publicize this, and RMLD wants us to publicize it. So as more information becomes available, we would love nothing better than to come back and bring you guys up to date and maybe bring Tom Olilo with us from our LED engineer. And I think a lot of your questions, perhaps in a, a little while, could have some answers. Well, I think just as a, you know, the, that idea of getting more out in the open <coughs> real public service. I mean, I mentioned that I get a lot of these calls and I talked to a friend of mine 
who is in, in, in the financial services business, and what ends up, I mean, everything is connected. You gotta follow the money. Um, and what I'm told is when you Google my house for this, it happens to be a place where this would work, and somebody wants that roof so that they can, it, and so, you know, so you've got, we people in, the, in this town need to understand that we're willing to, as a, as a town and as an elected body, step forward mm -hmm. and work on their behalf to try to help them understand when to say yes and when to back away. I mean, if it, and I think this is a this is a great topic. I'm thrilled that you brought it here. Um, thank you. Okay. Any other questions on this point? Because I think you guys want to tell us yes, what we yes. yes. <laughs> so you want to know. No, this is great. Uh, next uh, next slide, then, if you could. Uh, uh -huh. Bob, on <laughs> no, 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 no. I promise. No, this is easy. This is it. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, you might uh, recall that we've uh, the climate committee has done Earth Day probably the last four years at the uh, Matera Cabin, and we've kind of gone into conservation and uh, uh, appreciation of nature, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And then this year we kind of made a bit of a change. Uh, we went back to the RMLD, which we did even years ago when we had Earth Day events, and uh, we decided uh, RMLD was gracious enough to allow us to use their their facility. And uh, we are going to do an alternative energy for the home and car. So um, that's on Saturday, April 25th from 10 to 2. Getting the word out in Reading is one of the toughest things, as Kevin and Jean know from a past experience. Um, so we're, we're grateful here that we can help to get the word out. We'd love people to come. We have a, about a dozen, maybe 14 presenters. <laughs> Uh, they'll be inside with uh, solar voltaic. So some of these questions, you know, some of the, pri the price of solar panels and solar cells has gone down. So uh, we we've got presenters on solar voltaic, solar thermal, heat pumps, geothermal, uh, no combined heat and power, I will say. And we've got um, pellet stoves, a gentleman with a pellet stoves coming in. And, and we also have a gentleman inside who's going to talk about recharge stations for if you had an electric or a plug-in hybrid. Uh, and RMLD will also discuss their rebate offers. They're going to have a table, as well as an, uh, an LED kind of giveaway. Though last we spoke with them, they're working on having a virtual store uh, to sell um, energy-efficient items. And the, the LED bulbs are going to be reduced price due to a grant that they received. Oh, so nice. we'll be able to purchase those. I'll be there. Now, <laughs> in addition to that, outside, we have four, uh, four of our dealerships have agreed to bring cars. We've got the Chevy dealership, uh, Liberty Chevy, uh, uh, the Stony M Ford, uh, Toyota on West Street, and Nissan Leaf in Woburn. Nissan there. So they're all going to bring something. They're going to be out back. And uh, this is the time to come. And now when somebody tells, you know, this gentleman tells you his car's better than that car, you're right there. <laughs> let him fight it out. You know? Let also, him let, him, let him fight it out on the price, too, that day. Yeah. 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 Hey, <laughs> here's your checkbook. You're going to get the best deal you ever got. Absolutely. So um, we're kind of excited for this. Um, so the, the other thing is the climate committee, uh, on behalf of the climate committee, to congratulate John on winning a very tight race. <laughs> and for Barry, <laughs> Barry, uh, congratulations. And for David, who ran against you for throwing his hat in the ring. Uh, for the rest of you, for your service. For Paula, who got our slides on at the last <laughs> minute and probably got in trouble with Bob. So we <laughs> Paula, thank you. Uh, we're coming back May 5th to talk about a recycle bin. We'll pull that off and maybe at that time to give you an annual review. That will be if Bob says that's what we're going to do if it's time for that. We'll do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Okay.
Okay, next up, uh, we have some exciting news from the Reading Garden Club uh, about an event to be held on the Tom Common, rumor has it, on May 16th. Uh, who would like to speak on that? Come on up. No, I gotta find it. Well, you talk. I'll look. Okay. Dimitri, would you right. like to introduce so your? So I'm talking. Yes. Hi, everybody. Yes, I'm Dimitri Tsakras. I'm the president of the Reading Garden Club. This is Denise McCarthy, who's the vice president of the Reading Garden Club. Thank you very much for having us here. Um, we are. We've got a lot of exciting things <coughs> that we've done, and then we also have our plans now coming up. So we're going to be talking about all of it. But before we do, you should get solar. She should too. You both could have solar. Be great. Okay. Um, so first of all, thank you for letting us be here. Well, I don't have a. So I'm going to no, just you tell point. you. Um, oh, wrong time. That's the only one that's there. No. Let's go back. That's it. Okay. Where's my um, the thing? Because it sometimes splits into a couple of different. That's everything on the puzzle. Huh. That's what it says. Okay. So I don't have the right talk. I'll we'll, you can it. we'll pull this one up anyway. Okay. So that's too bad. It's not on for some reason it's not on this. Uh, is there a different drive beneath move, move. in this drive there are two um, scroll, no it isn't. You're right. You're windows. Fine. Fine. But I guess Sometimes it Sometimes it shows up as two drives. Yeah. I guess for some reason it's not showing up here. Nope, it's one. Oh, there a little arrow next to it? Oh, that's too bad. That that's okay. Uh, we'll if you can click on this one. Yeah, just give us the highlights. Hit them on our picture, if you would, the next one down. Let's just keep that up, and I'm going to tell you a couple of things of what we're doing. You have to imagine wonderful Garden Club members. So we do a lot of things. Our mission is basically to teach people about gardens, horticulture, and conservation. That's our mission, and we've been in action since 1956 here in Reading. Um, one of the ways that we do that is through our Adopt an Island group. We have over 100 Adopt an Island islands, which people, organizations, clubs, individuals make gorgeous gardens all over Reading. Some of you have been to our kickoffs and hopefully next year you'll, you'll all be able to make it that night. Um, we also have a very active um, civic beautification committee. You all know Camille. She was of course in your seats for many years. She's on our Reading Garden Club and she and a number of others do wonderful things with creating gardens. The one you all know is at the library, which is now gone. We dug it all up, saved all the plants. We moved a lot of them here to the town hall. So you have a gorgeous garden to go through when you come here, the back door from the parking lot. Um, oh, I had such pretty pictures. <coughs> and we're actually wrapping around and heading to the front entrance in a couple of weeks. You can see now all the dig safe things are up. So we'll be installing a new garden there. Uh, we also have a very active community outreach committee. We have an ongoing relationship with the Reading uh, Food Co-op, the food bank, and also um, with Daniel's Nursing Home. And we do a lot of outreach with kids at the Family Fun Day. Then we also have a horticulture group, which takes care. We're very lucky in Reading, as you know, to have the Parker Tavern. And as part of it, there's a historical garden, and this group maintains that historic garden. And then, of course, we have our Ways and Means Committee. They're very important because it's how we make our money. And what we're doing this year is we're having our annual plant sale, which we've done every year for many years. But of course, instead of at the library, which is under construction, it's going to be right out there on the town common. That's on May 16th. It's Saturday. It's rain or shine. Make sure you bring plenty of extra money for baked goods because these ladies can bake, I'm telling you. Um, and we sell annuals for your containers, we sell some vegetables, and the best thing in my opinion, we also sell our plants, which we dig up from our gardens, so they're very healthy and fabulous plants. So now finally I'm going to just turn... Um, Real your, quick, what time are you going to be out there? Um, on the 16th? Oh, or is it all day? I'm going to be out there all right day. 
Nine o'clock? Nine to noon. Yeah. Nine, Nine to, to noon. one. Okay. And okay. part of that, and I think you'll be talking more about this, but also new this year with the plant sales that we're partnering with the Cultural Connection. So we're going to have musicians and artists and singers wow. nice. out cool. there and performing. And just, it's going to be a great day. And after the winter we just survived, it's going to be an even better plant sale than it's ever been. So I hope you all really plan to make it. And I think our new garden out here will be done for that day. So maybe we can christen it. Garden our final stuff. project for the year that we're doing this year I don't know if all of you know about monarch butterflies. Have you seen them lately? No. That's because 90% of them are dead. Bad news. So if you have little children or if you have grandchildren, it is likely that those little kids are not going <coughs> to grow up seeing monarch butterflies. Can you hit the next slide, please? This is pesticide extreme weather habitat loss. Those are what we all want because those are the babies. And we want our kids to see them. Next one, thank you. Rapidly declining. We can zoom through this a little bit. Um, and zoom again, please. And again. So here's the real question. So what can a gardener do? Anyone in Reading can help with this. People across the country right now are sort of getting behind Operation Monarch. If you can show the next slide. First of all, you want to ban all this stuff, this Roundup stuff, and the next slide. If you're using that yellow sign on your lawn, you're doing something wrong. It's that simple. If you care about pollinators and certainly the beauty of butterflies, if you want your children to see them when they grow up or your grandchildren, if you want my honeybees to stay healthy, you want, or any honeybee, you want to keep pesticides should be off limits. Next slide, please. See his bee count is down, too. The other it's terrible. Down. It's just desperately down. But here's the really good news. Not only do you have to stop, and there's plenty of options to become organic. It's easy, and it's less expensive. And that's a win-win, in my opinion. But the best part about saving butterflies is you get to plant more gorgeous plants to feed them. So we'll go through these quickly. Salvia, chives, which you can eat, solidago, fabulous, echinacea, summer, it's perfect, joe pie weed, beautiful, asters, extending your season into the fall. Any nursery you go to, you will be able to say, I want butterflies, what do I plant? And they'll suggest plenty of plants. If you have deer, you make sure they're deer resistant too. Can I, can I guess? Marigolds? Uh, yeah, marigolds are good, but marigolds keep yeah. deer away, but That's marigolds attract plenty of pollinators. But here's the deal with monarchs. They only eat, when they're babies, milkweed. That's it. So if you don't grow milkweed, you're not really going to be helping the monarchs. So next slide, please. This is common milkweed, the next one. Those are probably recognizable. When I was a kid, you'd pass like great ditches of them in meadows and oh, yeah. fields. And in the fall, they split open and then they float away and they're pretty and they're fun. Those are hard to find now because as development happens, they go, they disappear under acres and acres of lawn. Next slide, please. And the next one. But this is a, a milkweed that's easy to grow in a garden because it fits right in. Next slide, please. See, it's sort of short and moundy and absolutely gorgeous, and it really attracts monarchs who want to lay their eggs on it. It also comes in yellow, so it's beautiful. And then if you, the next slide please, if you have a slightly taller situation and you can have bigger plants, this is gorgeous. It's also called Cinderella. It's a pink incarnata. Asclepius is the Latin name for milkweed. And then the next slide is Ice Ballet, which is also Gorgeous, they both smell like heaven, and they really attract monarchs. So, that's what you're looking for on the milkweed plant. That's what you'll get if you get those eggs. And then, oh, and then you'll see possibly this, this first, of course. So that's what you're after. Now this is just the only bad news, because nothing good, it's, nothing's perfect. Milkweed plants attract those nasty little aphids. So all you do is buy some insecticide and spray them. Wait, no, you don't. This is where you tell your little grandchildren or your little children to go out and squish them. 
or you do it yourself, <laughs> as I do. If you don't let this happen, if you go out and just tend your plants a couple times in the fall, your milkweeds will be gorgeous, aphid-free, and it's simple. Next slide, please. So if you want more information on our mission, monarchwatch.org, it's a fabulous website. You can even have your habitat certified for monarch butterflies. Um, I did want to put one final slide up saying we can't wait to see you at the plant sale on May 16th, Saturday, right outside here, change of venue. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you have questions? I don't know. I do. When is your annual judging of the island going to happen? Ah, the judging of the island is in July, July this year. Not a date yet. No date yet? Okay. And okay. yeah, so we'll be looking for judges. So. That'll be good. I, I've served in that capacity. Yeah. I know. Set, but I will pass the baton. Pass the baton. Else wants. As, I, think it, as I do think wanted. it requires special talent, though. What is that? <laughs> Understanding how to, how to grow flowers, how to, I don't, how to maintain. That's, that's my only half. Maybe the board <laughs> or selectmen should adopt an island. Oh, I like that idea. Hey, well, for the new guy. <laughs> <laughs> I said the board. <laughs> now, these, these plants that you have up there, were those uh, predominantly all perennials, annuals? Oh, they're all perennials. Perennial. Okay, yeah. There are tons of annuals that will attract butterflies, but I like perennials because Absolutely. They, come back. they come back. Yeah. Oh, and just one other thing. Um, I know you all recognized Arbor Day tonight. Uh, we are celebrating Plant Something Day, mm -hmm. which is May 15th, and we're partnering with Mahoney's, who has offered us eight Nyssa sylvaticas. Those are a um, black gum tree. They're, they're, they're a native, very tall, gorgeous tree, um, and we're going to hopefully plant one in every school on May 15th, so that'll be fun. They're babies, but they'll be tended to by the school, so. That's our, that's our mission. In which we've already sent out a letter to all the principals. Yeah, so. and we're hearing that, so it's great. Good. Well, thanks so much. Thank you very thanks much. You very much. Actually, Congratulations, one last everybody. One last, Thank you. Let me draw one last question. Mm. I, I, maybe you mentioned this, but I, I assume this is tied in through the grade school. Some, some of the, the monarch story and some of the plant story would really resonate with young kids, and although you're kind of building the next generation of gardeners. Of gardeners. So one of the things that our outreach bunch does, and we all do, is we have plenty of information at the plant sale. <coughs> I'm glad you asked this question. We have master gardeners, professional gardeners, people who really know plants. We also have creative arts coming. They're going to do a table, and that will really attract a lot of kids. And we're also going to do a butterfly, a monarch learning station. Then at Friends <coughs> and Family Day, we'll be doing the same thing. And we have a woman who's collected a ton of milkweed seed. So we might be able to actually plant some milk with kids. So I have a burning question for that day. What? Are, are you going to have, will there be Will there be vendors at your event that, because let me tell you, from somebody who, if I can't do it with a spreadsheet or a baseball bat, I probably can't do it. So, <laughs> you know, when somebody, if you wanted to hire somebody, will you have vendors there that could help you do this kind of you stuff? Do or do you just you have to somebody. intuitively try to figure this out we do not some of us don't have that kind of intuition right but the Reading Garden Club is definitely a resource for anyone who wants to know if you want to get your hands dirty and you want to learn how to do it there are a number of us who would be happy to help and if you want recommendations on people who can come in and do it because like I have a neighbor that drives by my house every day that I'm looking at that's in trouble now. <laughs> yes, yeah, see, he knows too much now. How about those solar panels? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. okay. But it's an excellent question, yeah. and there are so many talented. I think a lot of people are intimidated by. I mean, they see those beautiful gardens and they just go, "Yeah, that's not." Me. I can grow grass uh, yeah. sometimes. Yeah, because <laughs> it's just you know it's a little overwhelming for yeah. those people that don't do that. Not that they wouldn't want to have it. It's just so much fun. Mm. And you know what? Anyone who tells you that there's one way to do a garden is so wrong. So you just got to do it. Come to the plant sale. Yeah, we'll get Come you to started. Let me see, where do you get the plants? Uh, do you get so we buy um, wholesale from Mahoney's, mm -hmm. uh, the annuals and um, some vegetables. And then the, the members, and you have to understand, we're we're the youngest people in, in our club. club. We know. 
our the members are out digging in their gardens right now. And so they're, they're putting, basically doing cuttings and Yeah, they're and dividing things. plants and putting them in pots and oh. it's quite an effort. And those are terrific plants. So these are the ones that have already grown and thrived as opposed to right. going to Home Depot and you know yes. yeah, Okay, I could talk about this all night, but I think I'd better stop. <laughs> 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 and we'll be selling milkweed plants as well. At friends and family oh, day. and we're selling them at and the plant the sale plants, because yeah. we Mahoney's, which is a really reputable nursery, <laughs> and many nurseries around here are, um, will be providing us with milkweed for people who want to give that a try. And John, the first step, like if you want to plan your garden, is go online, pick out some colors, pick out some flowers you like, get some ideas. And then call the guy. We'll go from there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make. Just, just, think of it, just think of it as right. designing your baseball. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're fine. Thank you. Good night, all. Thanks, Mr. Neal. So I'm just going to briefly touch upon the uh, cultural aspect that they alluded oh, yeah, yeah. to. Thank um, you. We do plan on, I guess, infusing some cultural flair into the little. Uh, the event that they have going on. And I wanted to give a little bit of background about this group. They're calling themselves Cultural Connections Reading. And um, it all came about from a grant that we were awarded in 2014 from the Department of Housing and Community Development under the Massachusetts Downtown Initiative. So it was to, it was for a feasibility study for a cultural district in Reading. And, um, we started work in July of 2014 with a consultant from Prime Point Associates, and the goal was really to evaluate um, existing conditions in Reading and explore uh, potential for creating a cultural district in, in Reading that would help sustain and enhance the downtown. So um, the consultant worked with town staff to establish a working group which would guide the evaluation over the project months. It was a four-month project um, which concluded in October. We got the final <coughs> report in November. Uh, the working group included members uh, from town staff, members from the Economic Development Committee, Historical Commission, local business owners, and uh, members from our local cultural organization. So with this group, we were able to sort of establish a inventory of cultural resources and assets in Reading. And it turns out we actually have quite a few. We have well over 20 organizations and assets in, in Reading. Um, and that does not include any individual artists or creative professionals or design people. So what we ended up doing is then issuing a survey to these people and other stakeholders to really find out um, what their interest was in developing uh, a, a cultural district in Reading and also sort of seek out what they see the goals should be and um, strategies for this effort. So what the report before you entails is an overall vision and goals based on the, uh, the input from the stakeholders and the working group and as well as various strategies and action items including uh, next steps. The consultant also looked at various uh, models from other uh, communities, Orleans, Marlboro. Uh, we also looked at Natick and Beverly Arts District. And, but I would say the most important piece of that report is sort of looking at the next steps. And the primary, uh, I would say, immediate next step is to really think about um, getting this working group organized and increasing programming for the downtown. And in the long term, would be some sort of formal organization, maybe a nonprofit, that would seek out funding, apply for district designation, and facilitate uh, more additional development for the created economy in the downtown. So, since the report was finalized in November of last year, the working group has continued to meet to sort of carry out the recommendations included in the report. Uh, they've decided on the name Cultural Connections Reading, and in the very, very short term, their first action was to partner with the Garden Club. And actually that was at the suggestion of the town manager. He said that might be a good, good thing to look into. They took that direction and they've been focusing on it since then, meeting monthly to really get this event off the ground. The idea is that it's a garden club event. It's not meant to be in competition with the Fall Street Fair. It's supposed to be a small event with just some cultural flair. So what they've decided is to have representation from some some cultural groups that have agreed to, to participate. Creative Arts was mentioned. They are planning on having a table and doing artist demonstrations and activities for the kids. We also will have colonial course players who will have a few individuals um, and a small performance. The Reading Civic Concert Band will also be there to have a quartet performance. 
Reading Arts Association will have a handful of artists doing demonstrations throughout the common. Uh, and then the Historical Commission will have some information on the milkweed, uh, historical information on milkweed and the monarch butterfly. Uh, we also have talked with the Reading Public Library who will be available uh, to rent books about gardening, information about you know, the monarch butterfly and milkweed. And then the, we've also talked about various options to uh, engage the business community in some, some fashion, maybe encouraging them to offer sessions <coughs> or coupons during the day so that after patrons are done shopping for their plants, they could continue to shop in the downtown, in the downtown and um, really just stay downtown. Um, so moving forward, I think this group, the Cultural Connections Reading, uh, will continue to meet monthly. Uh, they hope to you know, gain strength and uh, really focus on carrying out those recommendations which are in that report and uh, starting with this uh, yes, event in May. Yeah. Um, Jesse, I think this is great and the fusion of the um, Garden Club and the cultural connection is an interesting one because it's taking what is uh, visual and turning it into the auditory or the sensory and it, it becomes, you call it flair, it's almost a garden for the senses, but you could imagine just as Rhonda Darius spoke about the need to get advertising and promotion for the Climate Committee, this group has a similar challenge in front of it to get kind of a group awareness. And I could easily imagine during the summer, whether it's, it's uh, events on the street corner, whether it's musical, whether it's performance art, if there were some concerted way to do that over the summer and with some branding, they'd really go a long way to getting a self-identity of the group, even though not everyone was participating. Right, so the group has thought about branding, has thought about creating um, you know, a more formal feel to themselves. We've also been working closely with the recreation uh, director, the community services director, excuse me, John Fiedo, on um, you know, ideas that he has. He does a lot of programming um, in town and is very familiar with the process. So he's provided a lot of insight to this group on you know, ideas that they can move forward Because yeah, the, the recreation department does an enormous amount of things you know, in, the, in the right. green space. You know? Seems yeah, like a natural the marriage the of the organization. Yeah. It gets back to it, now. I understand this is going to be. First of all, I think this is a really exciting concept, and it seems like it's more than a concept. It's you know, it's moving down the road. So, and this is going to end up not becoming a public committee. It's going to become a nonprofit committee of the community, right? right? Correct. So you know, so when they need to meet. They won't be dealing with things like public meeting laws and all those things. Have they taken steps towards the 501c3 status? Honestly, the like I said, the report was finalized in November, and yeah. at that time they really started. The, the seed was planted with the garden right. club, so all their meetings have been sort of focused on that, um, and with event. a little bit of discussion yeah. on moving, you know, carrying this forward. What should their mission be? What do they really want to focus on? You know, using the report and the initial study as a guide. Um, you know, so they definitely want to continue, and I think this initial event will sort of gauge the community's interest and sort of, you know, hopefully fuel it and give them, you know, even more inspiration to. Yeah, because in the back of this report, there's some very clear action steps that uh, can get moving mm -hmm. pretty quickly. Right. Um, and so what we need to do is encourage people to be out here so that the um, enthusiasm stays high on the yeah. 16th. Yeah, I mean, there's been a consistent group that has been meeting, and they're all very, very excited about it. So um, I, I'm excited about it. You know, we're trying to, you know, provide that, you know, bridge from the report to, you know. A group like this could be so supportive of an already exciting event in the yeah. fall that we have, the Fall Street Fair. I mean, there's just, there's so many, so much opportunity here. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, anybody that's watching this needs to know the 16th thing you need to get down here to keep the enthusiasm level high. Uh, I will be there. Thanks for the update. Yep. Thank this you. Oh. And the framework, this is, again, this is very much a garden club event, period. Uh, however, the framework's been laid, um, the likely construction of the library uh, lends this to probably be a two-year uh, location. If not more, they can decide that for themselves. But we're planning on them being here for two years because the library construction is just about May of the year from then. So that if they need to plan in advance, they can't plan on being at the library. So they're going to plan on having this event, assuming it's successful, uh, two years the plan set. And we'll see how the cultural thing works out. You know, the cultural groups, 
it's interesting that there are a lot more resources, although you recognize them all, you never saw them all on one piece of paper. And um, although they all mostly knew each other, I don't think they ever saw each other all in one place. Well, they probably didn't think of each other in, right. in a synergistic way. Exactly. And that's what this does. And that's exactly what this does. Um, and they're all starting to realize you can all help each other. You know, we're all helping each other. Yep. And I, I know in some of the early meetings, we had some interest from folks not even near Reading, far away, uh, different artists and different cultural folks. Um, and the point being that cultural activities don't necessarily obey town orders. It's actually kind of a good thing. Yeah. <coughs> Thanks, Jesse. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Jesse. Okay, our, our next uh, segment, we're going to have a couple of MAPC topics. Uh, so Steve Sapper's here tonight. Uh, in addition to being an MAPC member, for those that don't know him, he's uh, also the Director of Community Development for Tewksbury. Steve's going to talk to us about, he's going to give his member report, and then we're going to talk about uh, inventory of services that MAPC has been looking at with a view toward codifying some of our core services both on the town and talking to our companions on the school committee. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Jim Barosti being here tonight and Superintendent Doherty. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me this year. Um, my overview is really as the MAPC representative um, I think when we get into the talk about the survey that the individuals that are working on it will be um, okay. presenting that. That's fine. So, just for those um, that are unfamiliar with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, it is uh, one of 12 regional planning agencies here in the state. Um, it happens to be the largest with 101 communities in its um, region, and they break themselves down into subregions. So, Reading belongs to the North Suburban Planning Council, of which there's nine members. Um, most recently, there was a winter council meeting that was held back in February, where they were brought all of the communities together, all of the MAPC reps, and were um, looking at priorities for long range transportation planning. And the next council meeting will be in Salem on May 27th. Some of the things that the North Suburban Planning Council has done over the last couple of months, they run their monthly meetings um, the second Wednesday of each month at 9 o'clock, rotating through the um, nine different towns. The topics of conversation that they've had have been complete streets, um, legislative priorities of the organization, regional greenways, um, downtown initiatives, historic preservation, and most recently last week in uh, Wakefield, there was a uh, presentation on the stormwater permit, the MS4 uh, NIPTES permit, of which Reading had, um, I was present for that, and also the engineering department was there, um, which will serve the town well. The regional planning agencies in Massachusetts have um, access to district local technical assistance grants, which allow for the staff there to be funded for specific projects. And I think um, Reading has done quite well as far as those types of projects are concerned. Since 2012, there's been nine different projects that Reading has engaged uh, the, North, the uh, MAPC with. And uh, most of them have been successful. I would say all of them have been successful. Um, some of them are still in process, one being the Reading 2020 um, service inventory project, and then also the strategic economic development plan, which um, was a couple of weeks ago where right. the uh, mm -hmm. public meeting was held. And the, uh, um, again, my daytime job is a community development director to have a turnout of 60 people um, that was at that event at, um, was just fantastic. And I think the dialogue was great too for those that participated. Um, in closing, I think I would just like to say that um, besides <coughs> being the community development director in the town of Tewksbury, I'm also president this year of the Mass Association of Planning Directors. And uh, there's a great sense of pride when talking about what Reading is doing. I have um, 
nothing but great things to say about what we're doing here in, our, in this town and a lot of credit goes to the planning staff but then also to the Board of Selectmen and um, the town manager. With that, if you have any questions. Questions from the board? Okay. Then you get to the real. Yeah, the real, the real Nate. Uh, thanks very much, Steve. Thanks for well, thank, thank you for volunteering your time. Yeah. You're welcome. To you know, you, you take your professional skills and, and bring them here, and it's you know we really appreciate that. Yeah. When, You're welcome. You know, uh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Okay, okay you're on. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm going to introduce our um, partner from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, Mark Fine, but just to take a quick minute and explain to you what this is about. So um, as Steve Sadwick had mentioned, um, we've used the MAPC surgically introducing their services into um, some things that we have been working on. And I think as all of you know, um, Reading is pretty thinly staffed when it comes to planning and, and staffing. Um, we all wear multiple hats. And um, uh, the previous community that I used to work in, the city of Peabody, I had a staff of four planners. I had uh, six community development managers and a whole housing department. So um, as you can imagine, coming to Reading, um, it, it was quite, a, quite an eye opener to uh, realize, oh, you want something done? You got to do it. OK. So um, <laughs> which is fine. But really, at the end of the day, you know, there's only so much that we can accomplish with the limited resources that we have. And that's why bringing in the Metropolitan Area Planning Council to supplement what we can do and to um, work with us to advance some of our initiatives um, has been such a rewarding experience. And we're so very happy to have them um, and the good work that they do. So um, I'm going to introduce Mark Fine, and he's going to walk you through where we're at with the 2020 Public Services Inventory. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm Mark Fine, and I'm MAPC's Director of Municipal Collaboration. So, you know, I, I think a lot of the work that MAPC has done with Reading traditionally and with a lot of communities has really been on the, uh, you know, land use and planning side of things. But we actually have a department, which is my department, that does a range of other activities, including collector procurement, um, you know, a range of, of, of goods and services on behalf of communities. We also do a municipal services division, so you know that's that's part of what this project's all about. And as uh, the gentleman before me mentioned, you know, there's district local technical assistance. So in part, this project's funded through uh, some of that project funds that we were able to uh, give to Reading. Uh, and we also do homeland security coordination within my team across the northeast region of Massachusetts. So Reading is in NARAC, it's the Northeast Regional Homeland Security Council. We uh, administer NARAC on behalf of the state's public safety department and also do the fiduciary work across the state. So we have, you know, in that sense, we've had a lot of great relationships with fire, police chiefs, you know, emergency medical folks across the region, including in Reading as well. So that's a little background on what, what we do, but specifically, um, when it comes to this project, and I guess I'll sit down so you can see the board. Um, but yeah, I mean, what, we were asked by Gene and, and Jesse to look at, uh, you know, to do a service inventory. And I guess what we are trying to achieve is, you know, think about ideas for doing things differently. You know, uh, you know, the town offers a whole range of services, and actually, some of the documents you have in front of you captures all the information. You know, the core services are those things that department heads deem mission critical. Discretionary services are those are those services that you know department has didn't think were kind of core to their mission, but they delivered. And then uh, no, we asked a number of questions around reform ideas that they thought uh, you know could be pursued to do things differently. And we did this through a survey. And I'll you know I'll, I'll uh, you know I'll come to all that. I mean we'll get, we basically did a survey. Then we're going to run through the findings of that, and then we'll kind of talk about a few kind of examples of innovation in other spaces. Um, and then, you know, I'll come to the discussions and next steps and, you know, some of the ideas that we'll discuss with Jesse and, and Gene going forward about how we might want to do further work on behalf of Reading. Um, 
So yeah, as far as the, you know, the methodology for the project, you know, I mean, a lot of it was the fiscal constraints the community faces, and I think you know, Reading's certainly not alone in that. I think you know, people call it the new normal. Things are pretty tough even since the economy's back to bounce back. The municipal finances haven't necessarily bounced back with them, and I think a lot of people are asking questions about well, you know. Obviously, you can go an override route or there's cuts, but are there actually different things we can do, reforms that could be pursued that would provide, you know, you know, maintain high quality services even within the current strengths we face? Uh, so that was the context for what we did. And, and what we asked, uh, you know, through a letter that you have there that, that Bob sent around um, was we asked a number of questions of department heads, and it went to all the department heads, not the school department, but all the kind of town facing departments. Um, and we asked them, you know, which of their services were mission critical, you know, what could be done more cost effectively and efficiently, you know, what could be ceased to be provided by the town or maybe done by an outside party, um, you know, or through partnership, you know, are there things that could be targeted only to people who are most in need or potentially, you know, was the, is there a fee that could be charged for some of those services, um, you know, and actually, you know, what could be provided by you know, sharing or consolidating potentially with neighboring communities or in partnership with kind of different entities. Uh, so those are the, the questions we asked all department heads and we got, you know, pretty thorough and robust response. So if, you, you know, those documents you have there capture all the, you know, collate all the information received back from department heads. I mean, for one, it shows just an amazing range of, of services that the, town's the, the town delivers. Um, but as far as, you know, findings, I mean, I'd start with just some of the thematic findings that you know, you had, that, that we kind of saw, when you looked across all the different uh, returns from department heads, what were the type of things that, you know, were kind of coming coming across? And, you know, one of them was around, you know, record management pressures. I mean, I guess, you know, I worked in state government for a long time, uh, and, I've, you know, I, I've been a town meeting member, but, you know, when you're not on the inside of town government, you know, I think one of the, you know, one of the things that comes apparent when you actually look at the, the range of town activities is just how much paper, you know, the town has to maintain, track, uh, and, and capture from its residents. And I think there was questions around, you know, you know, is the information shareable across departments? Is it housed efficiently? Is it, is it accessible to outside parties? Uh, you know, are there things when you look across all the different departments doing this that could be uh, potentially joined up or, or looked at? You know, I mean, you know, Gene and I have had a few conversations about like dog licenses and why you know, it, you know, you continue to have to kind of, you know, bring the paper back into the clerk's office. With the, is there another way to do that? Um, and I think, you know, other things were just like some of the applications that have been, you know, designed, you know, and that are, are kind of, you know, pretty innovative, like C-Click Fix or this Recreation Finder, which, you know, when I looked at it, it looked pretty cool, and I'll come back to it. Uh, you know, those weren't always utilized as well, I think, as, as people would have liked. Um, you, know, you know, another theme, and I think we heard about it, you know, just before, is just kind of cultural activities. A lot of department heads, I think, you know, felt in some ways that some of the responsibilities they have to, they have to provide to pull these, these events off might not be, you know, the, the most efficient use of their time. Um, and I think, you know, you know, and I kind of heard what you guys were doing with this cultural commission, I, I felt, you know, it kind of struck me, you know, if there was a nonprofit that could actually run or partner, you know, uh, you know cultural events for the community potentially levering in some outside resource that could, could do that. You know, that might relieve some of the burden that some of the town departments seem to think they were facing uh, through these events. And then I just say about discretionary services, you know, a number of the departments didn't really identify any discretionary services. You know, in their mind, everything was core. Um, and, you know, that, you know, I think when you think about how an agency head might define their mission, you know, you, know, you, can, you can define those in various ways. But, um, but, you know, there might be some things to look out there. You know, are, are there, you know, I, certainly in like public health, library, elder, human services, or co conservation, there might be some areas that, you know, are, you know, are more discretionary and could be looked at for potential reform. Um, so I think there's an opportunity to follow up, you know, with some department heads on some of those areas. So that was just some of the thematic finding. But, you know, department heads did come back with a lot of reform ideas as well. Um, you know, and I think, you know, you know somebody mentioned the, the parking stickers. Uh, earlier today and like, you know, some dispatches of the police having to do that. I mean, when you looked at the kind of police return, it was, it just struck me like how much administrative stuff the police department has to do. And I mean, I guess, you know, it's just not my, not, you know, when you think of police, you're often thinking of what you see on the street. You don't necessarily think about all the things they're doing behind the scenes, um, you know, background checks, licenses, 
you know, they talked about fingerprinting and you know, they had suggested they outsource that. And I know, you know, like now there's a state law, for instance, where, you know, all school teachers, you know, all school staff have to be fingerprinted. And I think the state created like these fingerprinting centers and had an outside vendor do that. You know, I mean, maybe the police, you know, they're probably not the first people to think of, hey, you know, is it something we should continue to do or is there somebody else we could get to do it for us? Um, you know, I, I, I mean, that's, that's one example. Uh, you know, there's a range of other things that people thought you could maybe cease or contract out. Uh, you know, facilities planning. I think some of the flood map advice that the Conservation Commission uh, does, you know, that might be something they don't, they, I, it's probably not a requirement, but they do on behalf of, of residents. Um, you know, when you look at, you know, services you can charge fees for, I mean, I think in building, you know, building and, and planning work, just some of the things that developers get that they don't get charged for, you know, could be looked at. Uh, you know, some other fees could be charged in, in some recreational areas. In the elder van, that might be controversial to charge a fee, but potentially there could be donations. Uh, that was a suggestion by the department head there. Mm -hmm. And then just are there things to regionalize? You know, and I think, you know, when I look at this list, you know, we've done projects with communities on animal control. We've done projects with communities on a veteran services district. In fact, I was just in, in Holliston and Ashland the other day, and they have a four town, you know, veterans district. Um, that they say has been working great. Now, sometime that, you know, there's a window of opportunity they had because there was a retirement. Uh, and then there was, a, you know, the communities kind of had an opportunity to kind of move forward with that. But I mean, those are things that, you know, communities have looked at and, and done successfully, and it might be things to explore here too. Um, you know, feel free to jump in any time to ask questions, you know, but wait for me. So those were some of what we heard back, some good reform ideas, some ideas that, you know, you'd have to kick the tires on a little more. Um, and I just thought there was, there was potentially other opportunities that didn't necessarily come back as reform ideas, but when you just looked at what was being proposed uh, by department heads, you kind of thought like maybe there are some areas to, to potentially go further. So regionalization, I mean, it just always strikes me like there's a lot of things that communities do that are pretty similar. You know, like the tree work in one town is not necessarily that different from the tree work in the neighboring town. Um, you know, so there could be potentially areas to explore for, you know, some regionalization or shared services. Um, you know, obviously there's always, you know, staffing issues to figure out on those things, but it's not, you know, these things have happened in places successfully. You know, back office services, well, elder and human services, there's a lot of, you know, they use a lot of outside parties to provide services already. Um, but, you know, potentially that could be done in collaboration with some of the neighboring communities. Um, you know, in the records, permits, and licenses, I kind of talked about this before. I talked about the police and just the range of activities, you know, they really do that aren't really police work. Um, you know, and is that the most efficient way to do things? Uh, and then just organizational efficiencies. I mean, it did strike me in some of the returns that, you know, there are kind of parts of, of town government where, you know, they're providing kind of a, a coordination function for other, you know, a range of, of, of you know, other, other departments in town, and whether, there's some, you know, potential efficiencies that could be looked at there. Um, but certainly, like, joining up some of the public interface and permitting coordination across, you know, across a number of agencies could be, could be a potential win. Uh, so those are some, uh, you know, some other, you know, opportunities that could be looked at uh, going forward. Now, Gene and, 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 and Jesse had, had also talked about, um, you know, what are, what are other communities doing? And, you know, what are the things that we could potentially you know, look at that, you know, we could, uh, you know, we could kind of, you know, follow suit on. And I think some of it was also like, you know, why, you know, we have C-Click Fix. It's a pretty cool utility. You know, we have this parks finder. Why, why, is it, why aren't these things kind of generating more usage in the town? Uh, so that was kind of like, you know, online services. And then just partnerships. The thing is, I'd say like just hearing tonight, it was interesting to really sit through the whole selectmen's meeting. Because, I mean, I think, you know, there are a lot of successful partnerships here. I mean, that was pretty clear pretty much with every presentation that was made. But, uh, but you know, are there other areas where you don't think they, you know, where, where, where they haven't kind of caught on or they could be, you know, leveraged? I mean, I think like, you know, the Jesse's presentation on the cultural commission working with the garden, the garden folks is, is really interesting. Um, but I, you know, I was asked to look into some other examples from some other communities on, you know, on, on, in, the, in those two areas and, and, and I did so. And one thing, you know, it was interesting about the C-Click Fix stuff, because MAPC had a role with helping communities actually access the tool. We had done a CIC grant, you know, a community, community Innovation Challenge grant through the state that was going to help more communities kind of purchase what was called Commonwealth Connect. Steve, um, just for the uninitiated, you want to briefly explain C-Click Fix? 
Yes, yeah, sure, sorry, sorry if, uh, if, I'm, if I'm not explaining that well. Well, C-click fix basically allows you, you know, you can go, if you see a pothole somewhere, you kind of take, you know, you can, you can kind of note it on a map and tell the town this is where a pothole is. And, you know, immediately they can kind of see, you know, that there is a pothole there and that there is, you know, something to be fixed. And then you can kind of track whether it's been addressed or not using the tool as well. Um, so it's sort of like a, an online public-facing work order system in a way. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, there's a range of communities using it all across the region. And we actually have been doing a little bit of a study with Northeastern as to why, you know, certain communities are seeing more uptake and other communities not. Um, and I think what we've also been looking at is just community-wise. Why are some people using it and why are other people not? Uh, but I think one of the early findings was that where it's used by town staff, you know, and incorporated into the work order system overall, you know, that it actually has a feedback loop for actually town residents starting to use it. I think when you, you know, when it just becomes something that, you know, public works is actually on as well, and kind of the stuff gets kind of filed and filtered through that system, you start to see it. And I think Randolph and Malden are examples of where that's happened. And I'll, I'll just skip to the next slide. So is that the thing? Is this where you snap it with your cell phone, yep. snap a yep, picture? Yep, yep, yep. You can do it that way. And the app will send it directly in. Mm -hmm. So how are the, the towns that are utilizing it heavily, how are Let they? Let me just add something sure. that's important there that's missing. Um, we're receiving this now for free through our CIC yeah. grant via Boston. So we've only stuck a toe into the water on purpose strategically to beta test to see if we want to keep it. We weren't about to ramp the whole thing yeah. up and then decide, no, we don't think so. <laughs> so we have to decide between now and December whether to keep it or not. And then we have all sorts of you know, phase two, three, and four. But we only started with public works. Uh, clearly, this can be used organizational wide, but but it doesn't seem like we're be it's being utilized as heavily as we had hoped it would. Be. Um, you know, in DPW, not bad. Um, not as many people used it during the winter. They probably couldn't find the computer. <laughs> um, the pothole system, not so bad. But the map is interesting to see some of the communities. And again, part of it is because we're only doing DPW. But this is still instructive that um, the way to roll this out is to embrace embrace the whole thing community wide. And we'll be in a position to do that in the fall, presume when we go ahead with it. We finally got a quote, so I know what it's going to cost now, and it's reasonable. What do the dots represent? Uses? Well, so those are, yeah, kind of usage dots. So it's I mean, actually uh, pretty modest. Over the there must be fewer than 100 dots there, huh? Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess you know, so we, I mean, I was using this really comparatively to, you know, like Malden, which I guess is seen as like a really good example. They've sort of gone whole hog with this thing. You know, they, you know, they're pretty much covering their whole town kind of multiple levels. Um, and I guess they really have, like, I think there's been a, you know, they've used it kind of in a work order, man, you know, management system, too. It, it's become something that town staff themselves used to track, you know, whether they responded to a, a you know, a, a, you know, something the staff has found themselves. So, so I mean, that was just a, an example. I mean, potentially that could be, you know, if you're going forward and you think it's reasonable price, yeah. then, you know, how, how it's deployed could be a, a question. So it does that. more than pot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so we, I we could track all the all the phone calls that come into the town manager's office, for instance, or all the interactions that come into the town manager's wow. office. Well, and I guess like I, I kind of put here this Newton three one one example, and, and you know, part because like Newton's kind of you know ha, you know built a, a, a kind of more comprehensive tracking system for like every kind of mode of customer feedback. They have this three one one system, you know, and you can you know so you, you can give feedback and find information through. You know, multiple channels. It's kind of like the front page for the 311. So it's an example of, you know, a pretty comprehensive online portal um, that a, a community around here have used. Yeah, sure. So, Bob, two questions. One, if we do turn on the other modules, is there an incremental cost or is that simply. Well, there's two parts to that, which is what I wanted to comment. One's a license fee, which is reasonable, you know, 10 grand or so. Uh, the real issue to struggle with is staffing. Um, and we've looked at the full roll about rollout of this in other communities. The ones that generally do three one one have between two and six full time employees. So mm -hmm. Just managing those. Just yeah. managing the system. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you know, as you walk into a city hall, because they're typically cities, bigger cities, uh, there's a help desk right in the middle, and that's yeah, what this feeds yeah, into. Yeah. So Somerville is the one we studied several years ago, pretty extensively. And uh, Peter had hoped we buy a piece of software and it solves the problem, and that's kind of part of it. But you have to be ready to. We estimated five years ago we'd have to hire two, two staff people. The worst thing in the world would be to advertise this to get yeah, stuff right. And then, and then the EPO doesn't come out. Of course. Of course. <laughs> That's what happened in Boston with all their cloud streets. Yeah. That they just lost, they lost thousands them, yeah. of yeah. requests. So that would actually set us back mm -hmm. and cost us money. Mm -hmm. And I've never heard if this is ever used on the school side. Have you heard of this, John? 
any kind of a 311. So, of so it sounds like the goal is efficiencies, but if it creates, you know, more labor, it's got to displace something else. Yeah, I mean, exactly. so how does that work? I mean, does that well, does I mean, it I take away, you know, does it take away one job in favor of? Does it take away two jobs in favor of one job? I mean, I guess in this case, you know, like a lot of the online tools, you know, there is a, you know, a, a kind of back office cost to them. Um, I mean, whether, you know, the enhanced public services you're providing people, you know, would be seen as the upside and kind of counteract some of that cost, would it be seen as worthwhile? But I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. I think, you know, with all this stuff, there's an investment that isn't, you know, quite apparent by just clicking on the website. This is probably not cost down, it's quality up or responsiveness exactly. up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think when we started looking at like the online, you know, elements and then also these partnerships, those were less about kind of strict efficiencies and more about enhanced services uh, for the public. And I guess the other thing is, you know, I just, I, I kind of scoured some like gov tech sites and, you know, I mean, it was interesting, like Cambria, Pennsylvania, they're a small town and, you know, a small county in Pennsylvania. And they had recently like purchased like a, a pretty cheap, you know, online marriage license tool. So I thought it was an example of, you know, there are some communities doing some things that didn't seem, you know, it was like a thousand dollar fee and then, you know, fifty dollars per month to do it. I mean, it wasn't, you know, a, a huge investment. And whether you could use it also for, I think they're using it first with marriage licenses, then they wanted to kind of spread it out to like other licenses as well. Like whether there was a utility you could create there. Um, you know, to kind of make it easier. And maybe potentially that does come with an efficiency of, you know, some of the, the kind of back, you know, it can manage the system a little better. But a lot of this would be just enhanced customer service. I think that's the game. Yeah, you're going to talk a little bit more about your core services and reform ideas as we get into this? I well, yeah, so I've been given kind of a high-level summary, but we can, okay. if you want to get into or have questions well, we, about We do have members from the school department here tonight. I, uh, mm -hmm. I'd like to know if you're intrigued by this idea and possibly would like to follow up perhaps do a cross core service examination in the coming year. Uh, I think there's definitely some common cause we can make there. Uh, any thoughts, Gene? Absolutely. I think yeah. um, any opportunity to streamline and be more efficient is something we all want as common, so it's definitely something that we can back to our committee. Okay. Yes. Just to amplify that, I, I forget the date, but I had come before the school committee and you know, this, this there's a couple of common functions that we have, technology, um, HR. HR, facilities. facilities. I'm sure there's many others for those that are in, in the inside looking out. But just as we've regionalized externally with other towns, there may be opportunities to, even if it doesn't result in cost down, may get better responsiveness or be able to move more of the, more of the resources in the right place when we need it. Sure. Yeah, thank you. I just uh, a general question, and this was a survey done of, of department heads, um, of the kind of the core services that they, sort of their opinion of what they do. Yeah. Um, right. So I, I know over the next year to 18 months, we're going to struggle really mightily with sort of what kind of services can we afford to do as a town. And I'm just wondering if this model could be expanded to sort of include a community discussion. I would, I would wager to guess that if you you know, pull the average ready person, they might not know what they, what services we actually do provide. Some people say, oh, I, I didn't know we do that. So I think it's really important, especially as we sort of figure out how we're going to finance town government, and, you know, going forward, that we figure out a way to expand this to create sort of community forums so that the community can decide, okay, well, these, these are what we think the core services are. These are things that I think, well, maybe we can do without. Mm -hmm. um, because you know we only have a, a, a set box of money, and and if those services that people want exceed the box of money, then we have to figure out other ways to pay for it. So I think doing it internally might be a good start. But is there a way to, to does your organization sort of help towns yeah. sort of explore having community conversations about sure. sort of taking this out to the next level? Bob, sure, sure, we could. I mean, yeah, I was going to say, uh, Barry, uh, you'll soon be welcomed in the Saturday afternoon breakfast. <laughs> Reading 2020. Um, <laughs> this is step one. Yeah. Step two is for the six of us to give up some Saturdays and chat. Because again, the people delivering services rightly think their service is the most important. But you five, especially as the you know, CEOs, need to really look at where are your priorities, and I'll give you what information I have. And then absolutely the last and most important step is to ask the community what they think. You know from past financial forums which service would you give up? The answer is always none. 
And so this is a nice quantitative, organized way of trying to make it a little simpler than what it is here, but asking the community, um, you know, these are the services, what do you think? That's the most important step, I think. Yeah, and certainly, I mean, we were gonna, you know, come to like talk about next steps, and I think a, a public, you know, forum or some form of, you know, f you know, means of capturing public feedback is always kind of part of what we discussed, uh, you know, going forward. But I think, you know, the starting point was kind of get the, build the survey inventory, you know, and probably it needs some refinements, but then, you know, be able to go from there, uh, you know, obviously take take your views into account, you know, first and foremost. But um, just to. Uh, you know, so we we've, we've talked about I think these online tools. We've talked about secret fix stuff. I mean, just partnerships. And I guess, you know, there's, I mean, in in a way, you know, this was something obviously I think your town does quite well. I mean, there's a lot of existing partnerships, and it sounds like there's a lot of ideas, uh, you know, for new partnerships. But you know, I mean, there is, you know, when you just scour sort of what communities are doing either locally or even you know nationally. I mean, there's just a range of interesting ideas. I mean, I thought, you know, when we thought about schools, we didn't really look at schools as part of this exercise, but certainly could going forward. But but even just schools and, and elder services, just some of the interesting partnerships right. that have been crafted with kind of, you know, you know, seniors playing mentorship roles in the schools, but also, you know, maybe high school kids helping seniors with like online, you know, support, you know, or just, you know, getting them to use, you know, tools that they could benefit from. Good ways to kind of build that kind of intergener intergenerational kind of learning. You know, that, and that aren't like, you know, costly or, or, uh, Will you we know, have access you know, to this PowerPoint you're using? Yeah, I'll be able to send it, certainly. Yeah, could you? you yeah, I have some hard copies, but I, please, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, please. hit you with a lot of paper, I so I, <laughs> I figured yeah. I, I can definitely send that forward. But I mean, like some of these other partnership areas, you know, like, I think like Jeanine had tipped me off to this one in Beverly, and it was kind of on this arts and culture district, right, um, idea. Uh, you know, I mean, you mentioned, you know, you were talking about Chris Heron right. and the, the partnerships and substance abuse that have, have brought him out to high school. My, my wife's a high school guidance counselor in Needham, and she, they just had Chris Heron there as well. So it was, it was interesting because they said great yeah, things about it. Yeah, he's, 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 it was mesmerizing. Yeah, I mean, she for the kids. talked about it a lot, and you know, we sort of tried to bring our kids into the discussion. But, uh, but you know, I mean, we looked at this partnership in, in Braintree, which is you know, it's got a lot of the different players together, and it was just an interesting group that they had been to bring together toward on that issue. Um, the Beverly thing is interesting, you know, yeah. because you know we're now talking about um, you know the arts and cultural district. Sunday morning, I was in Beverly, and I was actually sitting with people from the chamber and from the arts and cultural district. We were sitting at a baseball game up in Beverly. Of all things, yeah. yeah. <laughs> shock, huh? It's a cultural um, thing, though. and it and it was a very what they're doing is pretty exciting. That's why I'm at, you know, I think it'd be important to capture this. This PowerPoint is not in the material that you handed out. I don't think. I I, can, I have yeah. some copies, but I. That would be good because you know there's stuff that I'm seeing it. up there that we, we need to dig deeper on. You know that time is never going to permit. I mean, we'll have you here all night long. <laughs> what we tend uh, to do to people. But yeah, I mean, I guess just you know, that's a good leading to sort of next steps. I mean, we talked about like, you know, the fact that this so far has just been an internal exercise. We just asked department heads these questions. You know, obviously this was another step to talk to you, but you know, a deeper public engagement would probably be worthwhile at some point. Um, you know, another thing was doing a deeper dive in certain service areas, and you know, we've been talking potentially about elder and human services, so. You know, there was, a, you know, I think a, the director of Elder and Human Services had sent us, a, you know, a scope for some work that MAPC could do in that space, and you know, we've taken a look at it, and I think within the project budget we have, we could probably do some work there. Um, you know, whether the kind of partnerships or online engagement themes or something, you know, selectmen or town, town leadership would like us to look into further, we could. Um, and then it's just, I guess, you know, are there certain reform ideas, you know, even if they were kind of small bear, like, you know, online tennis registration <laughs> fees, you know, is that something you want your department heads mm -hmm. to maybe develop? I mean, you know, actually, you know, I mean, actually, some of the Are stuff we doing that? <laughs> I think we are <laughs> doing yeah, that. Yeah. It's yeah. going to happen, yeah, but, uh, and It's yeah, pretty, so it's so working pretty well, too. Uh, unless, <laughs> no, yeah. Well, yeah, so maybe that's an idea you already have reached out to, you know, built, you know, starting to build out, but uh, there could be others that they mentioned that aren't being, aren't being built out, and they could come back to town manager or the board with, like, a more full, you know, fully developed proposal. And then just, you know, are there, you know, if there was regionalization efforts. I mean, a lot of my team, traditionally my team had always been about shared service projects, regional collaboration. 
I've been actually trying to change that and to do more of this type of work because I think there's a lot of work to help and support community efforts, you know, that, that aren't just about sharing across intermunicipal lines. I mean, there's sharing and partnerships that can happen just within the town itself, and there's efficiencies and effectiveness, you know, efforts that can be done within <coughs> town. So, you know, this has actually been a really exciting project for us because, you know, I think it's a, a new type of work we'd like to do more of. But, you know, we are still in the shared services and regionalization game, and I think we could, you know, if those were conversations you'd like to have with some of your towns, those are things we could try to facilitate. So. I think everything's on the table. I mean, I, you know, we kind of all talked about that. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, so that was, that was just a, a high-level presentation. I mean, you all have the inventory and the, and the kind of meat there. Um, okay. You know, we're glad to have further conversations or answer questions about it. But, uh, but otherwise, you know, if you have any further comments, you know, on what we what I presented, I'm glad to glad to hear it. It's being late, I know. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> yeah, Mark, thank you very thank much. You. Yeah. Thanks, Gene, Jesse, for your hard work here. Our friends from the school committee, Dr. Doherty, thank you for coming in. Yeah, thanks. Look forward to talking to you further. Yeah, Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Have a good evening. All right. What's next? Uh, anything else on the PC? We are now to the point of store and get the bylaw discussion on associate members. There is a, we have Article 12 on the uh, annual town meeting, which was placed uh, with, with very general wording. Uh, the uh, the new charter uh, does not allow associate memberships uh, unless they are authorized what by, by state law, bylaw, or other means, and this is one of the means that uh, we can use to create. Them. Uh, Ray, Ray Mieres is here tonight, our town council. Ray's prepared some uh, draft language. It's on page uh, 15 of uh, tonight's handout uh, that we uh, might offer as a, uh, a motion under Article 12 to flesh this out a bit. Uh, and we get that we up online. That up. I do. Yeah, essentially, uh, associate members, uh, it, it reinforces the sense that they serve for one, one, ter one year term. Uh, that the, this is only applying to the Board of Selectmen, right, even though the school committee has the right now to appoint um, boards? This, this would apply to any, well... Any board? Uh, why don't we let maybe Ray, Ray deal with that, yeah. Do you want to give us a little bit of uh, background on your thoughts here? Um, sure. Okay. <laughs> I read this to me just Selectmen, maybe I'm misreading it. Yeah. Um, so, the, uh, the idea... Um, the, uh, as you correctly noted, the charter uh, uh, recognizes the existence of, uh, of uh, associate members only in the uh, one instance of the zoning board of appeals. Um, the, um, this allows um, the bylaw, the charter also allows. Um, for a bylaw to expand that. So this is an example. Uh, this is a text that would expand it um, to the maximum. Because it says all appointed boards of commu committees authorized to file the court of the charter may have associate members. Well, that that so includes school committee <coughs> and the elected board. That includes, no, Article 4 is only appointed boards. Yeah, appointed. But I mean, not elected boards. They can now appoint the school well, committee. Well, the school committee doesn't. That uh, doesn't appoint any, in my recollection, doesn't appoint any of the boards that are listed in Article 4. This is, this okay. refers to the boards that are listed in Article 4. Yeah, I think I'm charter. confusing this with ad hoc committees and yes. other right. things that they are not. So is this just okay. us? If it's just is, our if, boards. If it is restricted to Article 4, yes. Yes. These okay. all, this these is all stuff that the selectmen are. Yeah, so okay. I was correct. Aren't there, aren't there, aren't there boards that are co appointed? There can be ad hoc committees, <coughs> like finance committee. Finance oh. committee is called appointed. That's a special appointing authority. But that's that, you know, that's not really three. the board. That's a member of our right. board and a member of the, you know, and the town uh, moderator. Yeah, this doesn't apply there very no. So I'm sorry, just to be clear, this does or does not apply to the schools. No. The there are no boards in Article Four not that are appointed by, by the school. school. But if there or were anybody a, other than the board of selectmen, yeah. if I'm right, is that correct, Rick? Yeah, um, that is correct. To my 
recollection. I know it would be helpful to put in here. It's just there's a list of the boards that have been impacted. We tend not we tend not to have the kind of the instructional stuff because there's no end to what you're trying to put sure. in. But I get your point. In hypothetically, if if there were none, mm -hmm. but they came to pass at a later date, would this language? No, because this is only applies to boards that are specifically mentioned in Article Four. Okay. All right. So <coughs> you, you could make it. So they're already established. Those boards are already those, established. All those boards already exist. Right. How are you doing on pulling up data? I, I don't know why it doesn't want to launch a second browser. It doesn't. Just uh, open under the tab. So, so could I summarize this by saying this supplies the Zoning Board of Appeals model to all the boards and, yes. and that associates can be brought into the core? You can right mouse it, Bob. Yes. Okay. Where Bob's? At the bottom. You see the bottom where the, where the chrome symbol is on the bottom left? Right there. Right mouse? Nope. Right back. Right mouse. Open another window. Oh. Hey. Uh, well, this is what was throwing me. So I don't want that. That's your home page. You just dial it wherever you want to go. I told them the story of the Reading Charter earlier today, by the way. Oh, did you? <laughs> the long and winding More or less. The long and winding road, yes. So, um, CPDC, the Conservation Commission, the Council on Aging, the Historical Commission, the Housing Authority, the Recreation okay. Committee, and the Zoning uh, Board of Appeals, um, the Charter Review Committee. And so would it count for this here? Yeah, does that just says, How does that work out? This, the, the bylaw refers to um, to go back to the language of the final. Oh, yeah. Can you do that? Yes. Uh, I can try. <laughs> okay. Um, all appointed boards are <coughs> authorized by Article 4 of the Charter. So that would include. I thought this included others. That's authorized. Any elected like board. So this would go authorized it up. by Article 3 no, of the Charter. Establish and appoint a. Uh, I can't read that part. Which um, one? And appoint or dissolve boards of committees oh, okay. from time to time. So if they if they exercise that authority, then it would be authorized. Let's just time. go back to three to make sure. But this is still all contained in those that we have jurisdiction. Well, no, well, because no, then you've got selectmen, piece, school committee, school library committee trustees, and the light board. Okay. And yeah. moderator. Even board. though they don't currently appoint any committees. Correct. But they right. could but by this. But if they came to pass, right. it would then apply. By 414, they could. So that's a that's a change. So they have that right now. Um, once the charters, I guess the charter is good yet as of yesterday. So yes. Okay. So everybody's got that. Right. that you know, everybody that's elected sounds like you know, has that right. Has yeah, that opportunity. Right. right. And those appointed have that opportunity as well, with the theory that those follow their jurisdiction. I mean, whoever appoints them, right. they would report back to. Them, correct. Correct. So that's, this opens the the, this opens it. the door for everybody. Essentially, everybody. Yeah. Try, the attempt here was to make it as broad yeah. as we possibly could. And obviously, if you want to dial that back, <coughs> you have to do that. Yeah. Um, Bob, I sent you a note on this over the weekend, but both the point we're making now and the one I'll make in a few minutes, um, because this is new and far ranging, and because this language is very well written, but you got to kind of read it a couple times to get through it, it might be helpful to have. Uh, what I what I describe as an instruction or a how-to guide just for the novice because both because of its implementation and the limitations of it, it it's going to be hard for people to wrap their head around it at first blush but they'll want to be able to be compliant. So a one-page narrative is what you're suggesting. This is how it works. Meeting. This is how well not just for town meeting but for committees wanting to appoint associate members. 
Uh, yeah, and my and my question that I never got to catch up to you on is, you know, A, is it for town meeting presentation? Clearly, that would be helpful. B, is it for all the boards and committees? That would be helpful. But is it belong in a bylaw? No. It okay. would be kind of an instruction only. Yeah, it's almost like a manual. Here yeah. you go. Yeah. Yeah. This is what it really means in yeah. layman's terms. But this yeah. is something that's going to have to be voted on a town meeting. Yeah, this, this is the language. specific language. So yes. get the instructional page. Oh, yeah. Would be extremely valuable in the interest of time in town meeting, and that's to help why people understand it better. You know? and, and that's why it would it was helpful for you to have this discussion now to try to decide, you know, free range chicken, or do you want to narrow it in? Because you know what the discussion will be, and town meeting can do whatever it wishes. Well, we do have five days set aside. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, Four. I figured three. Go to the discussion questions. of this specifically. Sure. Okay, yeah. um, a couple of comments. As I read through it, um, one area that we might discuss as to the number of associate members. This current language supports up to two thirds. Yeah. So one question is, how do you take two thirds of five, and where does it round up? Is it round down? Mm -hmm. uh, the second is the one-year term. Shall that be interpreted as the moment that committee member is appointed, or at the moment that they're all appointed if it's done annually or on some other anniversary? Those are two, and I got one more, but I'll hold it. <laughs> All right, so the first one, in terms of two-thirds, it says it shall not exceed two-thirds. So if you've got a number that, that produces a fraction, you round down. Yeah, round down. Yeah. So that would go in the instruction guide. Oh, that's what that means. It doesn't mean round up. Right? I could see that being one. No, remember earlier, round up is bad. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that Dutch. Well, you were paying attention. Right, yeah. I saw that presentation last week. I saw it. <laughs> Um, typically, when you appoint members, um, you appoint them for three-year terms or five-year terms, and you and, um, uh, you specify what that when the term begins. And this would be the same. You specify when it begins. It's it's open-ended. You can specify that it's July first. That, like it, that it happened on first of July, if that's when you want to do it. When you're doing the appointing, you would specify when the term begins. So they'd be rotating terms, ideally. Somebody, if the, another associate membership. Not associate. They're, not they're one, one and done, everybody. That's how we are now. Okay, but if I'm permitted two thirds and I have less than two thirds and it's a whole person and somebody new shows up but two months later and says, I too would like to be an associate member, there go on, now their anniversary date. <coughs> Different. I, I would suggest you I, make them all July 1st. Yeah. That's the yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I think you'd have to make them all. Right. Well, the, the problem with that day. is that if, let's say, you, you don't have a quorum at a particular meeting, then as the chairman of that committee could appoint, you know, how do you choose between one or two if your start gets the same? What this says is that you would choose the one that has the longest tenure to sort of fill in that spot. Correct. If everybody yeah. is the same, then you're open to, well, why did you pick him and not me? And does tenure apply to multiple years or just a single year to your interpretation? Right? If your term is over, is, does your tenure include prior term? Prior well, term? it says it's based on the length of time the associate members have served. And that would not include long. tenure. So, so that's tenure. That's tenure. Term. But what we will, okay. to, to Barry's point, we will have that problem right away once this is established. Well, that's true, but put an that's true. Associates right. in. At the same time. starting the same time, right? right. Exactly. That's true, yeah. but that's a startup problem. Yeah. The last, the last one, which I took me a second to pass through to get it, is the associate member assignment occurs only in the absence of quorum. Yes. So if you're at quorum or above, none of this gets applied. Mm -hmm. Correct. Wait a minute. Yeah, well, no, associate members are you, appointed. You're but appointed, but you're not sitting you, in to represent. You're not voting that day. The quorum is a is a meeting by meeting occurrence. Right? Correct. If so if quorum is met, right. no no associate member shall cast a vote. That's Correct. a circumstantial thing. That's an example of an instruction guide that, oh, that, oh, now I get it. So if yeah. you're down by one, you don't substitute an associate member to bring you up to five, in our case. Right. Not that yeah. it would apply, right. but just by way of example. Right. Four is, is above quorum, four vote, not five. And that, right. that's a hard, that wasn't, you got to read through this a couple of times. Oh, that's what that means. Well, we do have some committees. So, for example, you have a board of health. Yeah. They have, and they, this is always a, you know, it's a challenge for them. They have three people. And so this is going to allow them, if they chose to do this, one, correct? You chose to do it. If, okay. Um, if we chose to include a 
associate member to the Board of Health, for example, it would be one person. No, right? two thirds of three. Yeah, one. less than two thirds, right? Less than, less than two thirds. So, no, no. Shop not more. Not more. You could do it two. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. two. So it's not less than two thirds, it's two thirds or less. It, is there a reason you came up with two thirds? No. This no, it's completely arbitrary. It seems excessive to me. To, okay. I don't know what the right number is. I'm, I'm just trying that's to be as generous it. as I yeah. as I Well, under, under your own logic, it. usually it's always in there for a reason. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, oh, yes. Yeah. That's right. So so the reason is to try to make it as expansive as, right. it, as, as it could be. Okay. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. to, total yeah. fair game to discuss restrictions. Total fair game to say it should, it should be not more than half or it should be not more than a third. Or, right. You know, my last observation is I could foresee subsequent meetings of a group discussing a topic that spans, say, multiple meetings. Mm -hmm. In a circumstance where meeting one had mm -hmm. associate membership casting a vote, it will be natural for that group to want that same mm -hmm. associate member to sit in for subsequent votes on that same matter. But in fact, the way this is interpreted, they may not have tenure at a subsequent meeting. I'm, I'm fine with that, yeah. but the, rule, the instructional guide shall have to make that clear so that the natural human desire next, want yeah, if next time the, they're, they, yeah. they're not needed. Well, they're not inten they're not the tenured <coughs> associate. So right. you're saying in the, the, the next meeting there's yet again not a quorum. Correct. But there's now a more senior well, associate. Correct. And Jimmy can't vote tonight because the more tenured person is there That's and they're entitled yeah. by virtue of this. Yeah, I mean, it, on a committee like historical, when we have some folks here tonight, uh, if they're having a formal hearing, Ray, and uh, the associate jumps in on night one of the hearing, yeah. Does not that person have to, if he, he, he is That's needed to example. make up the quorum, would, would he not by law for the hearing to be valid have to, if it's continued, have to well, set the quorum? The meeting's not ended though. Um, right. So, Reading has the, um, the so-called Mullen Rule workaround. Which, what, which workaround? <laughs> Mullen Rule Workaround. Okay. It's not a mulligan. It's new to me. It's not a mulligan. You're making this up. Sounds like the Framus Bowl. It sounds like this could be something you're making. Okay. We're calling these. So, the Mullen Rule is a judicially promulgated rule in a case that was called Mullen versus somebody else. In which the court ruled that. In a, when a board is uh, sitting in a quasi-judicial capacity, like issuing a permit or, or um, conducting discipline or whatever, that only people who were present for the entirety of the hearing may vote. So it used to be a rule that if you missed a hearing, you couldn't vote, and sometimes the result was the, the committee couldn't act. Yeah, plus of course. Um, and, or, or in effect, the, the permit was denied because they couldn't vote to approve it. <laughs> so recently, there were a, a local option statute was uh, enacted and Reading adopted it um, no. to work around this. Mm -hmm. So what it allows is that somebody who misses one meeting, not more, mm -hmm. one meeting may um, Nevertheless, vote if he signs an affidavit that he has reviewed either tape or video of the meeting or has read the transcript of the meeting um, and therefore has enough information so that they can vote. How about the minutes of the meeting if we don't have the a transcript? Does, that doesn't enough? count. Yes, it's not so, so it would have to be televised yeah. and have to be accessible. We don't transcribe them right. that I'm aware of. Correct. Um, so, so if there's a tape or... If or someone made an audio tape. Right. An audio, an audio tape would be... So in the case you're thinking of, so, so you raised a good point though that actually we didn't think of, which is that that in that circumstance, yeah. in multiple meetings, you want the same associate right. to. Um, and this would enjoy you from doing that. Because right. if if, if, um, uh, if if there's a hearing and and one of the main people can't participate, well, sometimes they can't participate because they you know have a financial interest. Yeah. Participate. You want the same associate member to um, to participate. So, good point. We'll make a change. Now, is that is it also if if there's a quorum, there's a quorum. That doesn't matter on the set on on the second night of a, of one of the first meeting. In other words, the, the associate stepped up night one, was continued night two. 
you now actually have a quorum of, of um, appointed members. Mm -hmm. Does that associate, is that, is that appointed member no, now just going to sit there and let the associate be the voting member? Ah, good, good. The, so, so Mullenbrook would have prevented it, but the workaround would allow him to do that, yes. And boot the association, yes. Okay. Which, which gets in the way of having the same person in yeah. the two meetings. So yeah, it's getting yeah, thicker. Well. Anyway, these are, these are, I'm bringing this up yeah. not because I object, but more these are the, oh, that's where the instruction yeah, has yeah. to be read. This is government at work. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Any thoughts from our friends on the historical commission? Welcome. Uh, yeah. Um, I came in late, so I just uh, saw this um, yeah. now. Um, just a couple of uh, comments on my part, and then Charlene may have some others. But uh, the Historical Commission doesn't have a, an audio tape currently or a videotape, so right. that particular issue might present the problem. And there's clearly a need on the Historical Commission, as it probably is on others, where um, we may need to have uh, four, four members um, voting. At um, hearings, we do have them recorded. Oh, we do? Okay. Yeah. Oh, so okay. that's so where that, that we, resolves we, that problem. Probably, Demolition uh, delay. Yeah. What would be another example of a hearing you might hold? Uh, is that kind of it? That's it. Yeah. That would be the important one. Yeah. But the other thing that I wanted to add was um, we currently have, uh, and the Historical Commission doesn't have any set designated number of, of mm -hmm. members in the um, in the charter or, or members. I mean, it's uh, all the other all the other boards have designated numbers of members, but the Historical Commission, which has historically been five. Um, is at your at your discretion, um, but I point out that we currently have three associate members, um, so that could be an issue in terms of the the two thirds. I, I would assume. Well, three out of five. Yeah, it's you're okay. Yeah, you just make it. The other point is the statute for the historical commission. Uh, provides for, I'm not sure what the ZBA does, but the Historical Commission provides for uh, seven members on the historical, up to seven members. Mm -hmm. That doesn't That's specifically cite it. And it also provides for the number of associate members to not be greater than the number of regular members. So the, the statute would allow for more. This is state statute? Yes. Okay. Uh, chapter 48, I think. Um, would allow for more associate members in this language. than the two thirds. Right. Okay. But our charter trumps that right here for ZBA by saying five members and two associate members. Right, but it doesn't say that for the historical commission. Right, 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 right. No, it doesn't. Why is right. the historical it, it would, commission not designated a number? If everyone else is, why did that just never? I would imagine it's because they had a variability of attendance and they, yeah. it was yeah, it, to have a big established number. back in 78 or 80. Yeah. But I, I, that had come up at the at the last town meeting, and uh, the moderator had uh, ruled that order ruled that that it was not within the purview of, of amendment discussion. It was a good thought, but just unfortunately yeah. outside. Yeah. The yeah. And, you know, in the yeah. charter review meetings, that topic never once came up. Mm. The number we looked at it all. Mm. Yeah. Didn't see a reason to change any Didn't of what was on that. Yeah. Yeah. And for our demolition board. delay bylaw, we have to have at least four people. Yeah. The way we yeah. vote. Okay. So we really need well, to have at least five yeah. for the. So if you had three members, you'd be out of luck. We, we exactly right. we couldn't uphold the bylaw. <coughs> so if that could be revised. Okay. So um, further discussion, or what? What are our takeaways here in terms of changes that we need? Uh, let's talk about the two thirds thing. Like, level of comfort with the two thirds. The only issue I see is the uh, smaller committees where two thirds is uh, mm -hmm. confining okay? mm -hmm. three persons. Are there any three person? Yes, yeah, board, board, board of assessors. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the board of health is three. Yeah, the board of health is three. Board of assessors is three. Right, is not not maybe we'll four. soon be appointed. So ratcheting it down, to two thirds down, gets in the way there. But in Oops. the general case, where it's five or seven, it's not. And what are the likelihood we're going to get that many people showing up? They're pretty slim, I'd say. I mean, two. You get a full complement of two thirds wanting to be associates. In most committees, we're struggling to keep yeah. them full. Mm -hmm. and so perhaps and that's just a practical fact. Mm -hmm. you know, um, the reality is, we don't worry about it. I, you know, I, I'd love to see more people involved. I think all of us would. You know, um, so that you know, I don't think we should be limiting here. Right. What do you think? The more, the, the more, the, the the better, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I circled it when I was reading it. Just thought, 
you know, that seems a little high. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, um, because we struggle to fill some of these seats, um, it'd be good to have a bench so that if somebody moves out of town or just gets tired of it, you know, you have sort of a group of people <coughs> that are already well versed and up to speed mm -hmm. on the issues facing the committee. So, you know, we don't have to appoint two thirds, we can appoint up to two thirds. And, and, and my advice is somebody's interested to get involved. We shouldn't be discouraging, we shouldn't be encouraging. I agree with that. Yeah. So, let's let it be. I would let it be. Census. Cool. Any other thoughts? Ray's going to make that fix that we talked about. Uh, and, and just one last thought. How, how many um, how many committees aren't taped? Most. Most. They so can be on request, right? right. Or yes, no, depending on where they may. We have bandwidth issues, but aside from that, I mean, yeah, in theory. How many? Uh, who is equipped for that? Is Burger? Burger's not, right? <coughs> Burger's not. Conference uh, rooms, cameras. Room the next room is. Lower conference is not. Nothing else in town. Well, it's really about committee. the hearings, though, isn't yeah. it? Well, if you're talking about TV, RCTV, there's yeah. school committee, two in this room, RCTV. Okay. They can now move into buildings like Pleasant Street Center. That's on a delayed tape. basis. Yeah. On a delayed basis. So as long as it's as long as it's long as taped, so it can be yeah. it can be reviewed. How's the quality that's, of the sound? That's the big issue. I think in general you're going to want to have a meeting that's always on our seat yeah. to rely on as opposed to quick. We need you to get there tonight. We're not going to be able to get there. Right, right. <coughs> and then the audio, which that's news to me. Um, I doubt there's very many other committees that are just doing audio recordings. Without the video, so there, there, may, just, there may just come a time where, and yeah. they, well, they're we, just not going to be able to vote. Or not in that capacity. Or we know there's an important hearing coming up. We the, just, uh, someone could just tape it. Just as an aside, in the glorious days of yesteryear in the uh, '70s and '80s, John Agnew, who was the executive secretary of the mm -hmm. town before we had the town manager, he had stacks of audio tapes of <laughs> board of selectmen meetings in his uh, office. I think he did tape all of those. What, what, the private taping be sufficient? Oh yeah, it doesn't have to. It, it yeah, somebody, have somebody's to iPhone is putting it to a sit in the audience. You have to <laughs> announce it to the public and all that at the beginning. You have to. That you be. Meeting, you can, okay. You can, as long but those that you'll pick up. Known to the public. <laughs> <laughs> that okay. It doesn't matter <laughs> what <laughs> device it is. Somebody's. But we're going to we're going to fiddle with that language a little bit so that an associate member. I'll get John. That'll get you stink. So that an, that an associate member who sits in at a hearing on the first day of the hearing will, can continue we'll to continue serve the hearing, even right? if there is a, yeah. a quorum on another day. So okay. we're going to fiddle with the language. Although it's not dictated, I don't think. I wonder if this is the time to request or require that such meetings are at least audio taped. To Barry's point, it's absolutely trivial now to say click we're on let's go and it's a, a file that gets emailed around so it's not really a functional burden on any group any of the members I bet half of them at least could, could do it and having such a lightweight way to get a recording of these things <coughs> would be helpful particularly where you have the potential for associate members coming in and out and maybe there's a question of protocol or adherence or or even just what went on. There's a the vehicle to make this more obvious to people what went on in the meetings. So does that, so are, we, are, you, are you suggesting that that be done at every meeting that's not being officially taken? I wouldn't go that far, but I would say if the, if the cost and the effort to do it are small and it could be a, a, attached. Well, it's emailing a file. And it could be attached okay. on the website to the minutes as an mm -hmm. attachment like you do on an email and then you get the minutes if they exist and you have the audio transcript. You're done. Easy, easy for any one given meeting, difficult for an organization Perhaps. of our size with all the boards and committees. Maybe you do it selectively on the major boards. I'm just, is now the time to yeah. broaden it? I mean, I like RCTV, but they can't be everywhere all the time, and sometimes the audio doesn't come through. Audio file is about a mega minute, I think. So that could Less be than that if it's just audio. If it's compressed. I mean, we, we can accomplish you know, anything you want. It's just a question of resources. I don't want to be too much of a yeah, um, not speaking as representative of RCTV per se, but with enough notice, they should be able to set up just a camera, even a fixed camera on a tripod if you have a meeting in a room closet. If there are three meetings uh, at the same time, though, Steve, or five meetings at the same time. If, but if you've got somewhere you have public hearings or other things in particular going on, if they knew ahead of time, they may be able to provide enough single cameras. Not always necessarily, but it may, may be it may be more often 
Yeah, I mean, you would want to be selective that it's mm -hmm. not immediately involved a hearing or something where you need it to be able to bring okay. another member up to speed. It's just some, certainly something to talk to them about. It, so if you don't have to fall back to just audio. Do you have a question? Yes, sir. I just don't want to be too much of a white blanket, but I'm not really enthusiastic about the idea of attaching audios uh, or, or video or any time you can take to the minutes um, so such that there are, that, that both are the official record of the conflicting <coughs> record. And because inevitably no, no. something will, will, something in the minutes, yep. someone will argue that that the video or the audio contradicts Dear. something that's not what Paul is doing. I have been in cases where, yeah. where we spent a good amount of time um, debating whether the tape or the, uh, or the minutes were the best evidence of what actually transpired, and it's not pretty. So, um, that's so interesting. I think that the, I think that the, I think that the, I think that would, I think that would be an easy argument. Because? <laughs> because I just saw you say it, and over here someone else wrote down what you said. Okay. Yeah, well. Okay, I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm not doubting you. I'm, just, I'm, I'm saying that's interesting. In particular, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> the person said it backwards, said something backwards. Yeah. North of something and south of something, it was the, 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 the motion uh, um, was written down, I think, the way they expected it to be In the essence said. of what he wanted. Yeah, it was trying to say. Yeah. 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 And when it's yeah. voted yeah. on, the spoken motion is illegal. And yeah. then... Okay. The person actually had not said, you know, they read the yeah. the, the motion, but they got along very quickly. Got <laughs> yeah. along and um, so. It's a double negative again. All right. So that uh, I'm. I think it's a wonderful thing to have tape, videotape, as long as it's clear that. The minutes are the official. Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, just a real quick question. I, I missed. Uh, the rationale for the um, the longevity of uh, services being the um, the benchmark for picking the associate. What, what was the rationale of that, rather than just having it be at the discretion of the chair? Okay, so, I, so it's I'll not take, I, I'll, Maybe I'll my own opinion on, on Object, it. objectivity. I would say, well, two things. I mean, I think someone that's been on the board longer would maybe has a better understanding about you know procedural things. Um, the other part you wouldn't want is that you know whoever, depending on who the chair is, can cherry pick. His vote as well. We who's talked already. That? That's just my own opinion. I don't know if that was a thinking behind it. Those would be my two thoughts. Yeah, it's right. yeah. I think most organizations, to some degree, respect seniority over other measures when all else fails. It, it, to me, it just creates a way that doesn't it doesn't it's put two votes in the hands of the chair, right. yeah. which, which could happen. Yep. Um, the, in any other way, um, yeah. might happen anyway. But uh, okay. you know, um, at least it, you know, it, it creates a certain separateness to that. Uh, it's not the chair going, okay. okay. Let me see. Uh, yeah, I think I, I think I want you, John. Okay. Any any other thoughts? Thoughts. Yeah. Thoughts. Thoughts. I have a question. Yeah. Um, the way this is written, right? Um, 414, let me just go back there, opens it up to other boards and committees aside from the selectmen. But this here says only the board of selectmen shall be authorized. So would you have to change that if you wanted, for instance, the school committee? The school committee to appoint may a board, board and well, then to appoint well, associate well, members to that the board. Four corners of the original Warren article. Well, I don't know. Yeah. That's, that's what my question is. The language permits, but the board of selectmen must appoint. Isn't that isn't that the vast? I was looking at that sentence. I was thinking, why did I put that in there? And why did you even need it? Yeah. Um, but it's in there. <laughs> but, um, but what's the press? Right okay. um, but is that limited to board of selectmen for this town meeting? I think moderator would agree with that. No, if you take it out, I think the uh, I, I'm not sure you even need it. Let me let me think on that. Okay. But I, I I think you don't actually. I mean, the moderator has agreed reading this without the uh, new suggestion that he couldn't imagine any discussion that he wouldn't allow. Oh. That was the way he said it. Yeah. That's what he rules. 
but I don't know. Might take, but but it, doesn't this open up? Is this? Might I mean this? This is opening up for the boards to appoint their own associates. No, I, I thought that at first, but no, yeah, no. Still, everything still goes through the volunteer. Yes, through the elected board, uh, which eventually uh, comes uh, through us. Whoever is the appointing authority for the board appoints the associates as well. Right. So there's no, there's no. I, I have board for, for when I first read through yeah. it, that's the same no, but, reaction. I and the school committee is, isn't one of the ones authorized by our, right. our Article four of the charter is appointed board. Right. So, so you are not being authorized to appoint an associate member of the board of selectmen, and your and the school committee is not being authorized to appoint an associate member of the school committee. It's only appointing boards, and only the appointing authority has it. But the associate members follow the same clearing process that a regular member, <coughs> which goes so the board which come, which so, so come so one we interview them whatever it is that you <coughs> typically do when you make an yeah. appointment you do for associates. As well. okay. Got it. All right. So, I think you you have your directions. I think I do. Excellent. Thank you for coming in. Uh, final comments. If not, uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your interest. Thank you. Thank have a good, you. Night. good night. We now move for approval of minutes. We have the March 24th, 2015 meeting. Uh, move that the board select and approve the minutes of March 24th, 2015. As amended. Is that seconded? Second. Uh, Paul, I just had one comment. At the end of my uh, liaison report, I think there was one bullet attributed to John Arena that should probably be put back up under him when he gave his report. Uh, my liaison report on the 24th. Oh, yeah, okay, the last one. Yeah, the last yeah. uh, sub bullet in my. Yeah, you went back. No, okay. Yeah, but that's, that's under my. Oh, I see. Yeah, I see. That bullet's all I have. Okay. Any, any other amendments? Okay, uh, all in favor? Opposed? Standing. Four zero one carries. Is there any other uh, business to come before us in regular session this evening? If not, I will entertain a motion to go into executive session. Move that the board of selectmen go into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to litigation, and that the chair declares that an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the body, and not to reconvene an open session. Chair so declares. Is, uh, uh, is that seconded? Second. Okay, we uh, go by roll call for uh, the executive session. Uh, Mr. Halsey. Aye. Uh, Mr. Arena? Yes. Aye? Yes. Yes. Okay, we have five yeses. We are adjourned. Yes, we have to come back.